out of hand. I'm blacking out every time I pick up a drink. I'm gambling numbers that I, I can't afford. It just felt really, you know, at that point, there, was, there wasn't much left to give. Stephen Corker, it's 1-0! Stephen Corker gets it! Stephen Corker has got a debut goal for England! And what was that feeling like, knowing you're going to put the English show? Scared. Yeah. I was really scared, yeah. Okay. Other Henderson, Adam Lallana, Wayne Rooney, really Daniel Sturridge. I just felt like all oh, these players and like superstars. Do people from the outside understand the pressures that the Premier League footballers are under? No, no. As I moved through the leagues and started to earn more and more money, my gambling got worse and worse and worse. Give me an example how much you spend on a night at your peak. A quarter of a million above. A quarter of a million quid. And that's probably the coolest thing about addiction. It's like you're watching life fall before you. Because I was in the public eye, I guess people spare less. Sympathy. Where was your rock bottom in all of this? Jesus. Stephen, welcome to the show, mate. Thank you. Pleasure yeah. to be here. Yeah, mate. Very much looking forward to this one. Let's, uh, let's roll all the way back. Where did you grow up and how did you end up playing for Liverpool and England? Long journey, actually, yeah. So I grew up in Feltham, uh, West London. Was always dreamt of being a footballer. Um, at one point, it seemed like it was a dream too far because I was going on trial, got rejected by Reading, QPR, Southampton, Brentford. So all the teams basically around me mm -hmm. sort of got picked up because I was a star man Sunday league. And then as soon as I went on trial, it just crumbled. I was, really? I was a nervous wreck. I was, I was all over the place. So I never was able to show them my actual true ability. Um, and then at 15, I finally just, I turned up to Tottenham. I turned up the wrong boots. I had to borrow their academy manager's boots. <laughs> I had a, I think I even had a Burger King on the way there. You know what I mean? So I was kind of like, I was relaxed in the in a sense that I was like, this, I got rejected by Brentford who were in League Two at the time. Yeah. I'm not going to get signed by Tottenham. And it just happened. I think the fact that I did have my boots that day, it just kind of took the pressure off my performance, mm -hmm. got signed. And then one thing led to another, and oh, I was only five years after that, I was making my debut for England. So yeah. crazy how it just just changed, yeah. you know? But for the first five, six years, it was, was tough. So what was your journey like at school? Were you all about football, football, football? Was yeah, it? yeah. Obsessed. I was obsessed. Yeah. I, I, which I'll talk about a bit more about later, my addictions. Football was my first addiction. Yeah. I never understood it. Tony Adams once said it, and I thought, ah, not for me. And then I... I Today I see it and I'm like, wow, I was addicted. I just loved football, loved playing it, loved watching it, mostly playing. You yeah. know, I, my mum, I mean, it's funny, I'm that kids nowadays, my son, I am having to tell him to get out of the house. You yeah. know, he wants to be in there. I had to tell him to get out. In Back the, then, yeah. it was like, pff, my mum. me in. Exactly, yeah. that was it. I just yeah, yeah. I had to, mum used to say to me, make sure you're home for dinner, because I'd literally be out all day, every day, uh, playing football, just what I loved. Mm. And what age group was it when you actually got picked up going, you know what, he's a decent player? Because you said there were 15, you were getting rejected or 14, 13, mm -hmm. 14, you getting rejected. What age was it when you knew you were sort of the cut above? Probably from 10 or 11, I thought, okay, I've got a bit here. Like I was like regularly picking up like man of the matches and stuff like that at Sunday league level in the tournaments. But I said, wow, well, I went on trial at 12, 13, 14, and I was always getting rejected. So I kind of thought, well, I must be better than that level, but... I'm not that level, you know, when you go to the academies, the boys there, they've got the best boots, they've got the best kit, they all know each other, technically they're amazing. And I'm sort of there, just like a scrawny little kid, you know, before I filled out, I'm just like tall, yeah. lanky, yeah. basically, you know, I was just that. And I just, I was just, I just really felt the pressure. I just really felt when I walked into academy that I wasn't good enough to be there. And yeah, I, I, I said, when I got signed by Tottenham, then I started to actually have a little bit of belief in myself yeah. that actually I could, I could, I could probably do this. Did you have a fatherly figure as you were growing yeah, up? And a, yeah. And a, and a nice family home life? I did. I yeah. did, yeah. And, I, and often, again, my story, a yeah. big part of my story is about addiction. Yeah. I'm sat in the rooms and often people are going like, oh, I was you know, brought up in a, in a foster home. Yeah. I, I had this experience or that experience. Me, I had uh, two loving parents that are still together today. Lovely. I have a brother and sister. I had a really nice upbringing. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, I, I still to this day don't really understand why I'm wired differently. Yeah. But I am. Mm. And what was that journey like then? That, that moment when you when actually Tottenham said, "Right, we're going to sign you." Incredible, absolutely incredible. Yeah, I remember I, I couldn't sleep for a week. Yeah. I was just so excited, like, "Wow, this is actually happening!" Got got an opportunity, got the kit, 
oh, remember that first time getting a kit, getting all the, the bag of stuff, you know, Sunday league, you're obviously buying all your yeah. stuff, aren't you? Then it's just turned to like, right, here's heaps and heaps and heaps of Tottenham kit. Mm. And I, I must admit, I grew up sporting Arsenal, mm. you know, I, I grew up like watching Henri <laughs> Perez, that era, yeah. like, golden era of Arsenal. So, uh, I, that went out the window. I didn't care. If, like, <laughs> I'm, I'm Tottenham now. Yeah. Like I've got the opportunity to play. So yeah. um, that's where it just yeah, I was so excited. Um, but then, but then the journey began. Mm. Yeah, because okay, I was signed by Tottenham. But then it's like okay, you're signed as an under 15, under 16 year old. But what's next? I need to get a scholarship. I need to get a pro. So yeah. really, that's almost where the journey just began. Yeah. So it felt like at the time, great. I've, I've made it, but really, mm. I've made it nowhere. It was just a foot in the door, yeah. an opportunity to. Because you got a, you got signed at the age of seventeen. That's the earliest you can sign that these as days, isn't it? as a pro. Yeah. So you had two years of pretty much on trial at Tottenham. Yeah. To get that pro contract, what was that like? Got offered it early. Did got you? Offered it early, yeah, yeah. So I got offered it early. So I got offered it uh, by the time I was sixteen. They said to me, "Look, yeah, we want, want, to, want to give you a scholarship and we want to give you a pro contract at the end of it as well." So um, they saw something in me. Um, but it isn't mad like how can I've got rejected by all them clubs yeah. previously been at Tottenham for less than six months and they're going we see sir give you a scholarship and a pro contract so I actually had that luxury of knowing that I was going to be there full time um, but it doesn't really mean anything I say luxury still I'm still thinking I need to be at that level yeah. I need to be at that level I need to be at that level so I'm constantly chasing and chasing and chasing but use the term trial mm. right I feel like I've been on trial for, for 16 years <laughs> so I, mean, I honestly yeah. feel like because even now I go inside for a team and they're going but can he do this though can he do that yeah. well, he's, he's lost it hasn't he he hasn't yeah. got you know so I'm still on trial yeah. I'm still trying to prove myself mm. who was the manager at Tottenham at the time when you were there Redknapp Harry Redknapp and was Harry the one who wanted to sign you no no, no. So he didn't have any any clue about who I was. Did he cl Did he clock who you were? No, no. no okay. No, no. So he would have had I me. Mean, what you're gonna have 20, 20 young players yeah. at the time, uh, all different age groups. So he wouldn't have a clue. But as I sort of progressed through the ranks, then he'd be made aware. You know what? Stephen Cook was a, a decent player. Uh, Harry Kane, uh, Danny Rose, Adjust Townsend, Ryan Mason. I had so many good players in that. I probably missed five or six as well. So many good players in the age group. So there was plenty of him to keep an eye on. Um, but yeah, I would, I, he would have been made aware that there's a half talent instead of half there who's got half a chance of making it. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. What rough year are we talking here? Uh, that would have been 2007. Yeah. 2007. And in that squad of you, sort of 16, 17 year olds there, yeah. who was in there? Harry Kane, Harry Kane Danny Rose. Danny Rose, Andros Townsend, Ryan Mason, Adam Smith, who's at Bournemouth at down Bournemouth. the road. Uh, wow. Uh, Alex Pritchard, Tom Carroll, Jake Livermore. Proper uh, the talent. Yeah, yeah. That... That I don't know how that sort of era goes under the radar, yeah. um, but that was the most talent I think any academy has produced mm. in one one small patch. Mm. Like I mean, so many of us went on to play for England, Premier League, and yeah. so on. So yeah, the, the coaches they, they, they did incredible. Who well. who was it who gave you the belief? Mm. John McDermott probably at the head of it. There was Chris Chris Ramsey who was at QPR, Alex Ingleford was at Liverpool. They were two who had influence. But John McDermott is now FA technical director, so he's done pretty well for yeah. himself. He was the one who I think really believed in me um, and would pick up the pick up the phone and say to me after a game, "Why don't you do this, this, this? Why did you do that, that, that?" And I just he would always give it to me straight. Yeah, and I just I really appreciated the fact that. He did that with me because yeah. often you come off the pitch and your head's going, "Well, oh, did I do this yeah. right?" He would just tell me, "Yeah, you were shit. Yeah, you were this, you were that." Perfect. You know? So I actually appreciated that. Yeah. And I knew what I had to improve. At. Mm. And what was the what was the journey after sort of seventeen? When what was it? Well, hey, how old were you when you first made your debut? Seventeen. You were seventeen. Yeah, I went alone to Yeovil in League One. Um, best experience. Best experience. So you got your contract, and yeah. then they put you on loan straight away to yeah. give you the experience of. First team, first team footy. Yeah. So a lot of the boys stayed in the youth team yeah. and they sort of stayed protected in that bubble. Um, I had the opportunity to go alone, grabbed it with my two hands, went on loan, went with Ryan Mason at the time and John Beaker, who's now playing in Scotland. Yeah. So the three of us went to Yeovil. We stayed in a and b for a year, a year, <laughs> literally a year. I still drive past that every yeah. day. And I, thought, What's well, it? I stayed there for a year. Like, um, was there for a year. Yeah. Uh, Nathan Jones was assistant manager. Who yeah. Obviously, he's gone into a really good career. Terry Skiverton. Just got into that first team environment of just all of a sudden it's not nicey nice. It's like it's stuck in. Bang. Yeah. yeah. It's like people are fighting for their mortgages. Yeah. Uh, people think if you're a League One player, you, you, you've made it. I was on 
six hundred pound a week. Yeah. You know, so the boys there are fighting for their mortgages. Yeah. No, they don't mess it about, uh, and you're gonna get it. Yeah. You know, like you're gonna get. It. I remember playing against horrible strikers. Yeah. Wow, horrible. And Neil Harris. Yeah. yeah I remember playing. Well, they'll will. Yeah. We'll yeah. yeah. wait to me. Always just turn out, done that to my nose. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he's just literally. I said, he just bit my nose. <laughs> it's just like, get the fuck on with it. You know what I mean? So it's like just like experiencing like that. Like, poof, yeah. I learned quickly uh, before VAR. Yeah. So. You know, uh, the center halves at quarters are grabbing you, breathing down your neck, yeah. fresh meat, your fresh meat, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it can be intimidating. Yeah. And that's what they're trying to do. They're yeah. trying to intimidate you because it's all about getting those three points. Yeah. And what was it like then when you were there? Were you going, you know, I'm toughening up here. I'm yeah. turning into a proper man here. I know that I'm improving. Were you thinking, I'm improving so much, I can get back in that first team Tottenham. Is that always the sight? Always a sight, yeah, to be a Premier League footballer. Yeah. I don't know if it was at Tottenham because I started to think, oh, I don't know whether Tottenham's going to be a club for me, but I just felt I, I would be a Premier League footballer. This yeah. is going to happen because League One went like that. I played every minute of, of every game that I was available for and I, I picked up five out of six end of season awards. So I was like full of confidence, yeah. like I could do this. England came uh, under 19, so they said, we want you in the squad. So I was like, wow, like... Now I play for England and you get all the England kit. And again, it's oh, like, mate. wow. So all that stuff, yeah. I started to, I started to really believe, you know, that was the period there, I guess, where I started to think you can make it here mm. and make and make it big, bigger than maybe even I dreamt of. Mm. So. And what's the, what's it like being selected for England under 19s? Were you based at St. George at the time? No, it was before St. George's. Before, was it? Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to say... Uh, oh, Bishop remember. Abbey. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, Bishop Abbey. Yeah. And what was that feeling like knowing you're going to put the England shirt on? Scared. Yeah, I was really scared. Yeah, I just felt all oh, these players and like superstars because a lot of the boys there had been brought to Chelsea, been brought to Newcastle, so they were all there. Yeah, and I was like a little squatty kid who <laughs> only been at Tottenham for two years and was now in League One. I yeah. had no money. These boys were on big money. Yeah, you know, because they've been brought into Chelsea and those. What teams. sort of money were you earning when? You, what was your? How much were you earning on your contract then when you first signed? Yeah, I was six hundred a week. Six hundred quid yeah, a week. Yeah, but that must have been a game changer for you at the time, was it? Yeah, or because, not? Yeah, because I come from scholarship wages, which were hundred pound a week. Right. Okay. So when I went to six hundred pound a week, yeah, it's yeah. I mean, it's not it's not life changing money, but it was it was money in my pocket yeah. for the first time. And were you yeah. comparing what your other mates were earning at the at the clubs? Yeah. What sort of dough were they on? Ten grand a week. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah ten grand a week. Oh mate. Yeah, so exactly. <laughs> yeah. So okay. I was kind of like these these boys are in, in still in the academy bubble, but they were on ten grand a week. Yeah. And I'm like here on six grand a week. So there was definitely moments of jealousy. Yeah. Moments of resentment, and that's why when you ask me, did I picture my future at Tottenham? In my back of my mind, I'm like Tottenham just mugged me up. Yeah. I'm just, just about to say, well, I gave you six hundred quid. They could have locked you in with five grand or ten grand, couldn't <laughs> exactly, they? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And and I learned later on that. Not only that, the clubs were also giving money back to Tottenham for me to be there on loan. So it's like they Tottenham, so they were chipping in for Tottenham exactly, six were they? <laughs> exactly. So it's like Tottenham weren't even going right there. Let, 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 let him take all this yeah. full money. No, it was like that's oh, how it works. Right. Okay. So let's say Yeovil were paying twelve hundred. Yeah, I'm still getting my six hundred. Yeah, and Tottenham are getting their six hundred around those figures. Okay, whatever it is they get. And what was the movement there then? You've done Yeovil for how long? Done it for a year. For a Leave year, one. he went back to Tottenham. Went back to Tottenham. How long did you stay there for? Uh, I spent the summer there okay. uh, because I was injured and I met, then made my debut in the Carlin Cup, which is mad to say. I only remembered this the other day. Right? Yeah. So because someone was asked about Tottenham debut and I said in the Premier League, then I said, no, 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 I, I played under Harry. Yeah. Harry gave me a chance. Uh, and the reason why I know it is because that, this is how mad like, yeah. I've blocked, a lot of stuff happened in my life. So a lot <laughs> is blocked out, right? Is we lost 4-1 to Arsenal in the Carlin Cup. Yeah. Uh, but it was 1-1. One, one. Yeah. It went to extra time. And I had been out for six weeks, so I should have definitely been taken off. But mm. for whatever reason, Harry just continued to play me. Uh, gave away a penalty. We lost 4-1. It was all in extra time. And I'm like, half the pitch. I'm devastated. Yeah. I read in the paper, Harry's like, yeah, you know, young boys were cramping his ears. And I was just like, flipping out. He could have could have given me a little could've bit of positive. Big up. You know what I mean? A little say. He said, yeah, I think he's come off with cramping his ears at one point. So I was like, oh. Um, and then he put me on the bench for West Ham on the weekend. And then he obviously decided, right, Get him out, basically. And then I went on to Bristol City in the championship. So, What was your relationship like with Harry? I didn't know him. Didn't know him? I didn't know him, no. He never, he never spoke to me or, or any of those things. I mean, mm. I said, he was, he, he's one of those people who'd speak through the media. Mm. So you'd sort of pick up what you what you see in the paper, mm. really. And then from Tottenham, you went straight to Bristol? 
Shakespeare's on loan. Yeah, on loan in the championship. Okay, yeah. so, so they've kept you on loan, knowing that one day if he comes back, we might get some big money for him. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so it's yeah. like a dangly carrot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's like let's go get the experience. You step up a level now. You've done well in League One. Let's see what you can do the championship. And it was definitely the right move for me. Yeah. I, I would hundred percent vouch for any young player to go on loan. Great club. Yeah. Great city. It's where the casino started. Yeah. So it's where the off the field issues yeah. started yeah. to appear. However, on the pitch again, great year, great experience. Um, Playing against like Grant Holt at Norwich, just you know, uh, strong physical yeah. centre half, like difficult, you know. And then you had your Jermaine Beckfords at Leeds at the time. Yeah. And the game was top, you know. So really good. I was actually playing against really top players who went on to play Premier League football, yeah. and I was getting that experience at eighteen. Mate, quality. Yeah. And when did when did the, when did you first start? When you were growing up, were you around naughty lads your age? Yeah. Did you get? tempted at all to get caught up we all know what goes on in london at the age of 15 16 so were you ever tempted i dipped my toe in yeah yeah on a few occasions you're probably younger than 14 15 mm. i reckon 11 or 12 uh i sat i was familiar with with police cells i spent time uh with the wrong people yeah. let's say and just dip. that's that's not fair to say the wrong people just basically i, I look a bit like they're just on their journey they're, they're their a path. little bit lost yeah. at the time uh, I was definitely caught up in that cycle as well, mm. wanting to earn money quickly. Mm. Um, yeah, and I just, I just, I got nicked for shoplifting, <laughs> stuff like that, you know, just stuff, to, just yeah. silly stuff. Yeah, I used mate. to go to school with an empty boot bag, yeah. fill it up in the shops with all the sweets, and go to school and sell it. Yeah. So I was almost like a young entrepreneur. Entrepreneur, mate. To, yeah, to, yeah, mate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's where it all starts. Exactly. That's where it started, <laughs> trying to take the money. And then one day, I got caught yeah. and then I've never, oh my God, I've never shit myself yeah. to that. Just, you know, when the security guards got me. Yeah. And it's like, because it wasn't really in my nature to be doing that, yeah. but I've just caught up and yeah. I'm thinking, this is, this is good money. You yeah, know, 20 yeah, yeah. pound a day, yeah. 12, 13, yeah. it's good money, yeah, you know, yeah. especially 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. So uh, I definitely dipped my toe in it. And then I said, I, I kind of, I knew that this wasn't really the life I wanted. I, I, I did really know that even though, I was involved to a certain yeah. degree, so I managed to pull away. How easy was it for you, or how hard was it for you to have your tight bunch of mates, them seeing you progressing and becoming a top footballer and going on that route, for you to actually go, you know what, I've got to, I've got to step away, I was, I'm going to get caught up with that and that, and I'm going to get in trouble. It was hard. I think the hardest part was when they all started going partying yeah. with girls and doing whatever they whatever they choose, basically. Yeah. And I was like on a on a strict diet. I was on a strict curfew. You know, my 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 days weeks were taken out by training at Tottenham. You know, I used to get the tube two like two hours after school. I have to try to do the homework on the on the tube. Yeah. And it's all packed, and then train and come back and all that. So my life was was filled with that. But uh, what helped me was obviously at Tottenham. You've got boys in the same bubble as me, mm. all the boys there wanting to make it. And interestingly, some boys couldn't get out of the street life. You know, when you're at a club like Tottenham, they've got mm. a lot of London boys, South London boys coming, North London, yeah. everywhere really. Yeah. Some of them couldn't get out of the, the trap, so to speak. And uh, and, and unfortunately never made it, mm. you know? So I, you know, I had clear examples constantly in front of my eyes. And um, I say it was never really, I don't think even if, even if I wasn't a football player, I still wouldn't have we've got Stepped into that life. I still but it yeah. takes discipline to what you've done yeah where was it when the discipline sort of you lost a little bit of discipline on the booze and the gambling what sort of age group did that 18. start it was 18, 18 was yeah, it 18 definitely down yeah. in Bristol down in Bristol yeah so when I was telling you I was earning 20 pound a week from yeah. shoplifting yeah. Sorry, a day from shoplifting yeah. I'd still lose it on penny up yeah the penny up the wall yeah, I was yeah, yeah. to go there and lose my money that way so oh. constantly had that that buzz for that need for more yeah but when the casino started wow well, then it just went out of control mm. you know i was in there to two three in the morning from eight to age of 18 and just started losing and losing and losing and i'm chasing mm. so i'm not one of those gamblers that could tell you like oh i stop. won my first bet yeah. or stuff nah, i was no. just chasing my losses constantly mm. it's a it's a dangerous addiction that gambling one isn't it they're the worst they're because worst. i think like, when i look at gambling you see someone who's a coke addict or a, or a boozer or did a you can get to see in their faces and, mm -hmm. and whatever. The gambling is like this hidden thing. Yeah. You know, if you went out and had 10 pints and your coach next day was like, mate, you stink of booze. You, yeah. you know, you get caught out. You can go and drop three grand, four grand, come in and put a smiley face on. Yeah, yeah, no one could tell. As I moved through the leagues, it started to earn more and more money. Uh, my gambling got worse and worse and worse. And all that happened is casinos start opening new doors. Yeah. So then it's like, it becomes even more of a secret bubble because they know, they know, like obviously, 
he can't be seen here, yeah. can't be seen there. So you start to go to the private casinos and everything's done and taken care for, taking care, every, everything's mm. taken care for you, everything. So from your, your transport to your hotels, to your food, to whatever you want, mm. I could go with you, take 10 people in there. Like, yeah. What champagne do you want? What this, yeah. what that? So on moments where you're winning, you're on top of the world, yeah. you know? Everyone's in there drinking champagne, thinking it's amazing. Yeah. When you're losing, phew, no, there's, there's no worse place to be. Were you one of those gamblers who would tell people when you'd won? No. Nah. Were you one of those gamblers to tell people when you'd lost? No. No. Wow. Them, I don't know tell anyone anything. Wow. Don't tell, the reason why so I only you and your own mind knows. Yeah, me and my very close friends. Yeah, I, I'd okay. go with. I always want to go with somebody. Yeah. Do you know the reason why? Because that journey home would be suicidal. I'd be, fuck, I, and I knew, like, when you go to the casino, you've got 99% chance of coming out. Yeah. Well, I've got 99% chance of compulsive right, yeah. of coming out, having lost. So I'd always go with somebody yeah. because I needed somebody in that car home. Never speak to me, by the way. Never. They would. They know the script. Don't. Don't talk to me. Don't tell me nothing. <laughs> just sit there. Yeah. Just sit there. Stum. That's yeah. it. And, and my friend always tells his stories. He laugh. He's like, it was one of the worst times of my life. He said, just sit there. I know he's going to be bombing it. Put my seatbelt on. Just sit there. Look out the window. He would be like petrified yeah. because I'd be like going mad yeah. inside my own head. But he would just be sat there thinking. I need to support him, mm. but how? What mm. do you say? Offer him food. I'm like, I don't want food. Yeah. I don't want this. I don't want that. I was, I was horrible actually. You know, when I think about it, because addiction fully had a grip on me, mm. and I was horrible to be around and difficult to be around. So it was like, I mean, you often use the term Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah. You know, one side of me great on the way there, yeah. nicest part on the way home. Phew, don't talk to me. Different mm. person. What sort of money were you on at Bristol when you first started your gambling? Uh, I was on two and a half grand a week. Two and a half G's a week. And then two and a half grand appearance fee, for example. Okay, so, so you, could be, you could be taking home 20 grand a month. Yeah, comfortably, yeah. Wow, yeah. And, and when you saw that money come in your bank, I always think players should be paid cash, by the way. Yeah. I know cash is out of the system right now. <laughs> Every player should be got. imagine at the end of the week, you go, right, when you're back, you're like, yeah. boom, there's five G's in cash. You're like, yeah. okay, well I can stash that, I can keep a bit of that, I can spend a bit of that. But actually, yeah. if it's just coming in your bank account, yeah. you're going to casino and you're going, I have yeah. a grand on red. Yeah. Or yeah. play craps or yeah. play poker. It was always roulette. Always was it roulette? Numbers. Yeah, yeah, numbers, neighbours. That's, that was my thing, always. Um, but yeah, so, uh, I mean, I'd love to get paid in cash. I've, I've played in Turkey for a little bit. I've yeah. played in Africa, where yeah. you do get paid in yeah, cash. Yeah, and yeah. It always feels more. Yeah. Because when you're counting the, the, you, the dollars, you're thinking, well, it's You realise what's going out. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So that's why casinos, again, everything's taken care of. Uh, credit, you know, you're not even having to put your card there. You mm. just sign in a piece of paper and there's 100 grand. You know, it's it's so easy to, to fall Give into. Give me an example how much you would spend on a night at your peak. My peak? Uh, yeah, quarter of a million above. Yeah, was was just out of control. A quarter of a million quid. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez, man, I've got I've got fucking goosebumps on yeah. me. Wow. It's it's to explain it. It's like two. Uh, the numbers for me are like two different things. So if we went for a, a, a meal, yeah, I'd be thinking that's expensive. Yeah. Like, so we're for a meal now today mm. I've got it's, it's expensive so I'm not uh, a big spender mm. so I, I, I just explain to people because they think young dumb stupid yeah. but nah it wasn't like a glamorous lifestyle it was like I was so desperate to get my money back that the only thought that goes through my head is you just keep increasing it yeah. just keep increasing it and obviously as I said the casinos and the bookies made it easier and easier to do so um, so yeah I was I was doing uh, I first did six figures uh I don't know, 21, 22. And then once once I'd done that in a night, I just, that's it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. What, what, how does it work with a casino? Mm -hmm. So if you're going in there, you're a face, they're looking yeah. after you, they want to be spotted and da 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 gambling. How does it work? They've just got your, you handing over your card or they're saying, like, there's 100 Gs on your card, there's 100 grand's worth of chips, off you go and have some fun. Yeah. So it all depends where you play. So it all depends. So it's a different casinos offer different packages. Um, if you're playing in London, they don't really need to attract you. So it's literally, there's a hundred grand in your car, there's a hundred grand's worth of chips. Yeah. If you're playing abroad, where they put these packages together, uh, there's a hundred grand, okay, there's 150 grand chips. So they give you, you know, a, a welcome bonus. Uh, if you lose, they start to give you percentages back on your losses. So if I lost a hundred grand, they'll give me 35% back. So there's okay. you know, 35 grand back for me, which again, just take it in chips and play it. I, you know, I, you know, I continue to play. Um, and then obviously the check started. And that was for me really the biggest, the biggest downfall of my life. What's that? The checks. The checks, yeah. Credit, credit. 
credit. credit. That was where that was for me where everything started to take a turn because now I didn't even need access. Now I just needed to go sign a piece of paper. Oh mate. Yeah. And they where, know what they're up to as well, don't they? But they yeah. don't know your personal finances to know what stress and pressure you're they, under, right? Well they know to a certain degree because they don't just give you the check without knowing you've got enough to cover it, right? Yeah, but uh, they don't know how much you're getting in debt. Yeah, because or I played you... different places. Yeah, I played different places. So they knew I had a problem. You know, there's no, there's no denying that. But I take full responsibility. I did it. You know, yeah. There's no one else that did it. They don't. They don't put a gun to my head and say, "Come and play here today and sign a check." Okay. I, it was on me. You know, it's all on me. Um, but I'm well aware through my story, through other stories, that they make it very difficult to stop. I'm not going to say easy to play. They mm. make it difficult you know, for you to stop because it's everywhere you look. Mm. Everywhere you look, it's gambling, gambling, gambling. I get text messages, get WhatsApp messages, get emails. It's on my TV, it's on mm. my radio, it's everywhere. What emotion, let's talk about the 250 grand night, which is mega money, right? Mm. What emotion do you go through of having 250 grand's worth of chips, knowing that these chips are getting less and less and less as the hours and hours are going on, knowing that you are going to be walking out here with zero chips? Yeah. What's the emotion from the excitement at the start to obviously being, yeah. like you said earlier, suicidal at the end? Yeah. What's the emotion? Uh, yeah, you're taking me on a journey for sure. Mm. So I, I, firstly, uh, excitement, so much excitement, just knowing I'm going to play. I'll be excited all day, thinking oh, I'm going to go play tonight, that I've got the excitement. So all of that, that's the build-up, that's the adrenaline, that's the rush, get the money out, can't wait, can't even wait quick enough to the car to even just give me the chips, you know what I mean? I'm just there, I'm so excited, I'm like a kid, I'll be mm. so excited. Take the money, rush to the table, first bet, bang, bang, bang. Um, I would often get up, I would often get up, that was kind of, um, oh, that was kind of my biggest issue. I could never stop. So, so when I, so just to give you a little bit of insight, yeah. how I first got to six figures was because I, I won six figures. So then I was able to lose six figures, yeah. and then that's how. So it's kind of that's how it starts for me. It's like the bigger I win, then the more I end up losing yeah. because I start to realize all oh, these numbers are possible, and the more and more belief I have that these numbers are possible. Um, so the journey would be five, ten. So I'd spend like five grand, then I'll start spending ten grand on a chip. Yeah, so I would, I would call one bet. Yeah, you know, okay, five, for five Gs, okay. Yeah, five grand yeah. spin and yeah, win or lose. If you win for my five grand, I'll be looking at about 18 grand back. That would be my kind of spin. Um, I do, so I basically cover 10 numbers, mm. got 500 each number, 18 mm. grand back. Mm. So that would be my spin. Uh, if that loses three or four times, I'll double it to 10 to try to continue that sort of thing. So I always knew at a certain point it was gone. You know, as a, when the energy changes, you know, and then that's where any gambler listening to this can relate. That's the hardest bit to accept the next morning that I just threw away the last 30 grand yeah. because it almost seems like chicken change. Yeah. It's, you've just lost 220. Fuck's this 30 grand gonna do? Yeah. Fuck, I just want it, I actually want it gone. Yeah. I want it away from me so I can get out at this point because yeah. I'm so disgusted. Um, and then obviously the journey home, head's gone can't believe it next morning i'm going to work what's the point of going to work i can't even earn this money back this is going to take me i mean that would still be two months to earn that money back mm. i mean i was earning obviously ridiculously good money mm. but it's still going to be two months to earn back a quarter of a million net mm. you know net, you can earn yeah. back a quarter of a million a month and the tax money takes 45 yeah. so tough right to start to, to to motivate myself to go in and train um and then that's again as i said where it then affects my my job so then the money starts to stop coming in mm. and then the spending goes up and it's, you know, that's where the real sort of shift happened. When you're going into work the next day, did any of the players know that you've been gambling no. the night before? No, nobody would know. Nobody would know. So there were certain things I'll show certain people. Yeah. You know, I was at Swansea, for example, we had a squad of gamblers, yeah. you know, shaggers, drinkers. It was, a, it was best year ever. <laughs> yeah. you know, best year ever. Um, yeah, so that was, I was 19 playing Premier League football. With a for squad Swansea? Of, yeah, for Swansea. Yeah. In a squad of that. Yeah. It was just insane, right? So it, but what it did was made me feel it's okay. We finished 11th in the Premier League, yeah. you know? So I'm thinking, well, everything's great. Yeah. Pulled up for the Olympics after that. Yeah. So it was just encouraging me that I could continue this lifestyle. There, people would know oh okay yeah steven's got an issue i mean i actually whilst i was injured i went to rehab um during that period and everyone was aware so people okay. had known okay steven's got some issues around the gambling and did that do you go rehab just for gambling yeah just for gambling so when you were gambling on a night out were you boozing as well yeah that started after though that didn't start straight away because before i was just the gambling was enough yeah but then as i got to let's say 20 yeah it then started with drink to numb it I couldn't deal with the lows. Couldn't deal with the lows. Couldn't deal with the fear and the pressure of playing because I would be so 
scared that if I lose this, I know the consequences now. Mm -hmm. You know, I knew at 19 when I took 50 grand or so off my agent, you know, I told him that uh, I need house deposit, I need some help. Da, da, da. From the outside, I'm a Premier League player. Yeah. You know, one of his, uh, let's say, uh, gold mines, yeah. you know, he knows this is, you know, no problem, 50 grand. Mm -hmm. Send me 50 grand, lost it. Do you know what I mean? Lost it straight away. And then it's like, so I went to rehab and I was aware of the consequences, that feeling of how to pay someone back. Mm. That's where that began. And that's a sick feeling. Where was your rock bottom in all of this? Do you remember the day when you're like, I can't yeah, carry there, on with there, this? There's been so many. Has there? Yeah, there's been so many, yeah. yeah. There's been so many where I've said, that's, that's my rock bottom. There's, there's not going to be any more than that. There's not going to... I've, I've, I've always taken it to new levels, always. Uh, and even today, I think... Oh, my rock bottom is, is my rock bottom over or would there be a new rock bottom because mm. uh, it's just like that with me I'm so impulsive that it's just it could be a moment where I decide that's it I'm going to do it and I do it it's done Yeah. you know no, no, all the things I put in place to stop me but if I decide I'm going to do it it, it just takes over yeah. and, I, and I'm there it's, uh, so when do you sign for Swansea under what Brendan Rodgers yeah under Brendan Rodgers yeah. yeah good manager yeah really good manager good yeah. man manager yeah, he was. He was good for me. You know, I was uh, just like little details when I when I first arrived, picked me up from the station, drove me around the city. This is where you could be, you know, this is this is what it's like. This is here, she's Nando's, there's that, you know, just like yeah. little touches like yeah, that. Yeah, that yeah. I never really had since, you know. Yeah. Twelve, twelve years since then. Never mm. had a manager welcome me to a city like that. But it's a really nice feeling because you feel part of something straight yeah. away and you know he he cares about me. You know? Yeah. And they got he got you said they got eleventh in the Premier League. Yeah, it's eleventh. Was that the same year that Cardiff went up as well? No, Cardiff went up two years later. Did you ever play in the Cardiff Swansea derby? Yeah, played for Cardiff two years later. Oh, what, against that, your old club, Swansea. Against Swansea. Oh mate, what was that? What was that? Scored and we won one nil. Really? <laughs> oh <laughs> mate, quality. Yeah, yeah. What was the reception like? Uh, I played at first game was at home. That game we won. So obviously the Cardiff fans loved me. Yeah. Obviously winning the game. Going away? Going away was tough. Yeah, it was tough. Every time I touched the ball, booed. Yeah, it? Every time I touched the ball. Yeah, we lost 3 0. Got our asses felt, and yeah, every time I touched the ball, get mm. booed for ninety minutes. Which I get, it's the rivalry yeah. and all that. But I, I loved both clubs, you yeah. know, because both both clubs were good to me. The both I, I had really good experience at both clubs. So as a player, I'm in the middle, but I understand as a fan. Yeah, I yeah. get it. You know. And how long were you there for, Swansea? Uh, a year. A year. I'm, I'm not noticing a pattern like a year here yeah, and a year here. Yeah. Why do you think like you're having a year here and a year there? Uh. So to begin with, because of the loans, yeah. that was just a case of going, going away, getting experience, League One, yeah. Championship, Premier League, mm. back to Tottenham. But then at, from Tottenham onwards, for the past 10 years, the reason why I've had a year everywhere is because uh, until I got clean was because I just, I would start somewhere where it's all fresh and new, great, you know, I'd be all excited by it. As soon as uh, the gambling started again and the drinking started again, uh, I wanted out. I really? wanted out. I wanted to run away. I wanted to escape, and the clubs were more than happy to let me go because they could see me deteriorating. So they're thinking, let him go, let him go, let's get him out. You're saying there, you saw the, you you said that the clubs can see you deteriorating. Yeah. Who in their club could see you deteriorating? Because you, you said that no one knew you had a gambling addiction. Uh, alcohol was was very uh, very obvious at that stage. Yeah, so everyone could see that I was all over the place you know um the drink so i'd go to gamble to give it a bit of a, mm. a bit more detail i guess yeah. i'd go yeah, to gamble yeah. would, would would be drinking at this point with it uh would lose inevitably and then i would get absolutely off my head okay. because i want to block it out that i've yet again done it how have i done it again how yeah. so i'll drink and it wasn't I will, i'm not a, a social drinker i won't go and have a beer or two yeah. i'll just go line up 10 sambukas and just go bang 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 so them sambukas once they hit me yeah was like phew, blackout blackout and then i'm gone and when you're in blackout do you feel at peace i don't feel anything i don't know why where i'm at don't know. so that's that's the most bizarre cycle that i was in but i didn't feel anything but i guess that's what i was searching for because i couldn't sleep yeah there was no way i could go home and sleep so the only time actually my mind was off mm. was during blackout but I would wake up in police cells. I'd wake up in hospital beds. I would wake up in the front of the newspaper. And I've got no explanation as to how I was there. Oh, you know? Right. So clubs would be confused. Yeah. Because the Jekyll and Hyde, this guy who is polite, talks yeah. to everyone from the cleaner yeah. to the to the president, whoever, you yeah. know, would always be the same of everybody, respectful. Was this guy? Yeah. Who who's that? Mm. But it's me. But you're oh. nulling out the pain of the gambling addiction. Yeah. So that blackout is nulling the pain yeah. of all the emotion that you're going through. Yeah. 
Give me an example when you were on the front page of the newspaper. Oh, many times actually. Um, wake up. Uh, people will say this in AA, like, oh, yeah, the biggest fear is that what have I done the night before? And I, I'll tell you what I've done the night before because I've got 25 text messages and 50 missed calls mm. and people knocking at my front door. So I'd have the newspaper come and literally knock at my front door. And I'd be hiding under the covers. I'd drop a text to the sporting director or the manager, I can't make it in today, I'm sick, or this, that, and the other. They're like, well, you weren't, because we've seen it in the paper. Yeah. Um, and that's where the lies yeah. would start. Um, I would then obviously just spend the whole day trying to hide from the press. Um, oh, that's the guilt and shame of explaining to my parents what I'd done. Um, especially the early stages, for them, they couldn't understand it. What was I doing? Mm. You know, now they have a far better understanding mm. of that I was sick, you know, but, but at the time, they're just, what are you doing? Yeah. You know? Um, really really shameful and i'll just feel so guilty so i'd spend the whole day and really the next week feeling guilty yeah and then the only way to block it out again would be to pick up a drink and then that would be the cycle because i'd be lying there trying to sleep and i can't um so that'd be it and that's where obviously sleeping pills for a lot of people come into it i never touched them but I might as well have. I always say to people, it's like, well, I never did drugs, but yeah. I might as well have because I the, the drink was my drug, mm. you know, uh, and I really abused it. Wow. There's a lot of pressure. You know, we're looking in, mm -hmm. for anyone looking in, going, oh, Premier League football is running a fortune. Why is he on the front page getting larrups? Why is he with that bird? Why is he doing coca? Why, the, 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 do people from the outside understand the pressures that the Premier League footballers are under? No, no, no. It's, it's all very um, it's glamorised, isn't it? You know, so people are put on the front. I mean, Wayne Rooney would be a classic yeah. example. Put on the paper as a three hundred grand a week, whatever he's earned. Firstly, how much of that goes to the tax, tax man? Forty five percent. Half of that. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you know yeah, yeah, so that's yeah. half. How much is he giving to charities? There's another. How much to his X manager? Yeah. To his agent? Yeah, 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 to this? Yeah, yeah. To that? Right. So first and foremost, mm. it's not the three hundred grand a week that they all perceive. Mm. Irrespective of that, it's a lot. We earn a lot of money, yeah. right? For yeah. sure. And there's yeah. no, there's no hiding from yeah. that fact. But it's a very short career, and that might you need to be sensible with that money, or you end up like myself, mm. fucked, basically. Mm. So if you look at, you know, Wayne Rooney, again, using him as an example, um, how much stress and pressure, yeah. he, since the age of 16, yeah. he's been the man. He's been the man that England rely on. So you look at, I look at his forms of escape. That's what I look at. I look at, you know, where it's be the women. It's, yeah. a, it's a form of escape, where it'd be the gambling, form of escape, the drink. Yeah. And every time he does it, he's a bang, yeah. front page, bang. Yeah. So then the guilt, the shame, all of that comes with it. So there's a lot of pressure for these mm. footballers. And then you get the good ones who can handle it all. Mm. Your Harry Canes of this world, mm. yeah, they can handle it all. You know, they're great people and they, they manage to. But for me, if I was a plumber or a football player, I would have still gone through the same That's behaviors. Right, yeah. And because I was in the public eye, I guess people spare less sympathy yeah. because you had it, you had my dream yeah. and you fucked it, yeah. you know? Um, and I knew that and I felt the guilt mm. for that, you know? So um, it definitely, it, it, there's definitely a little shift now where mm. people are starting to realize footballers are humans too. Yeah. And if you're suffering with addiction, it doesn't matter if you earn 10 million or 10 pound a week, because mm. you earn 10 million, you do 11, you earn 10 pound, you do 11 pound. Yeah. That's it. And, uh, and there's an understanding amongst gamblers mm. that it's irrelevant who you are or what you earn. Mm. You know, you're gonna spend it. You're gonna spend it yeah. and spend more, mm. you know? And so it's definitely changing. I've noticed a shift in, especially in the last five, six years, but it, it used to be quite cruel. Is there a big gambling culture within Premier League football? There's a culture, yeah. Um, I wouldn't say it's it's massive. Um, Depending what club you're at, I guess, doesn't it? Yeah. Where groups of lads at the yeah, back of their bus. Exactly, and, yeah, exactly. I'd say probably lower down, there's more of a, you know, poker on the bus and stuff like that in the lower leagues. But, I mean, as I always say to people, like, I wasn't that gambler. I wasn't, mm. I wasn't a social gambler. So I'm not interested in playing cards on the bus for 50 quid. I'm not interested in betting on a horse <laughs> or whatever. Going yeah. like, like, I just want to go bang. You know, that Pure was, roulette. Pure roulette, yeah. I did horses, but uh, and the odd bit of football, but it never, it never excited mm. me. It was the, the roulette that got my adrenaline pumping. People who know on the scene who you were a gambling addict, did you ever get approached by anyone to fix any games? No, no never, never. No, I've never. I mean, I mean, even in Turkey, where it's like renowned for yeah. that kind of thing, yeah, never. Like no one's ever said to me. Cause that's why I always find hilarious. Yeah. Like, well, not actually, hilarious is not the right word. I always find bizarre. That all these betting companies that like, you can't you can't bet on football. You're mm. a football player. You can't. You see all the big bands coming mm. by and telling us, so, as if we could predict anything. Yeah, we have no, we have no clue heading yeah. into a game. We're going to win, lose, or draw. Yeah, no clue whatsoever. So it's actually bizarre for me. Yeah. I, I suppose they know that you know what teams we put out. Yeah. So in a cup game, that could be the only advantage. Yeah. I could know that you know what Wigan are going to field a slightly weaker side today. Yeah. 
or yeah. such and such is going to get a yellow card in the first three minutes. But, uh, or I mean, he's going to kick the ball out. There's all these different bets you can yeah, do now, isn't there? What, but, for, for 20 quid? Yeah. Like, I think so, yeah. So everything's, everything's blocked off anyway. You yeah. try to put a bet on anything and it's like, yeah. you know, you can't put this, you can't put that. Yeah. The only time where I got in trouble was with uh, transfers. I was going to move to, uh, well, I did move to Southampton. And from? Uh, from QPR. Okay. I went alone to Southampton and I was like 10 to 1 to go to Southampton because the bookies had me at 2 to 1 to go to West Brom or something yeah. like that. So obviously I told my mates and they've gone up. They were weighed in. They were weighed they? Bet, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'm sat there then getting in, uh, investigated by the FA. No. And I was just like, I, I, like, I, I, I didn't profit from it. I didn't know. Yeah. Like, they just asked me, where are you question, going? question, yeah. I'm not going there. And uh, they've all jumped online. Like, Fucking hell, I could see that there. So I don't blame them either. Because, mm. I mean, at the time, it wasn't even public knowledge that you yeah. shouldn't bet on that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, um, yeah, basically what happened was Coral, which which is just, that for me, sums up the bookies. They reported it because they had to pay out and they said, no, 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 oh, no, no, okay. no, no, Betting suspended. And then they go through the whole process and then all, all the basic core wanted was no payout. Yeah. And that's what they got. Yeah. Because the FA said, look, you need to obviously retract it or whatever. And, but uh, your name gets tarnished with that. It did. Because, although it just never because, went, yeah. just, I may mean, not gone public, but just because yeah. you went, oh, boys, I am acting out Southampton. I'm moving next week or a couple of days. Yeah, yeah. They've got them weighed in, but yeah. it actually comes back on you. Yeah, it comes back on you. And you see with many players, especially now, it's like, wow, you can't even do that. Yeah. So you can't even tell your brother or your mate, mm. but you go in there and if they stick some money on yeah. it, like, uh, but the, it's, it, that's down to the bookies. They mm. don't want to part with a penny. Yeah. You know what I mean? They yeah. do not want to part with a penny. When you were talking here, I think we're talking now 2011, 2012, that sort of yeah. period. There wasn't the apps then. No. We could be gambling on the apps. No. You were pure casino. Yeah. When your addiction carried on, did you get onto the apps? Yeah, online, yeah. Yeah. And what was that like? Did that take it to another level? Um, yes and no, because obviously it was accessible everywhere. So then I started doing it before. I mean, it was, a, it was around, because mm -hmm. I was still doing it at 19 online. So what it was, was when I couldn't get to a casino, Friday night before a game, a few, a few of the boys would be in there, would be betting online. You know, pre-season trips away, we'd go and bet online. Yeah. So... Uh, that happened quite often. And then I wake up for the game and I'm depressed, I'm shattered because I've been up since till, till, till 4 a.m. and I'm horrendous. I used to, before it, I used to have limits on when I would gamble. Yeah. So I'd say, I never gamble past a Wednesday. Yeah. Then a Thursday, then a Friday, and then it's like early hours mm. of Saturday morning. I'm still betting, mm. you know? So I was out of control. Mm. When you're a gambling addict, are you thinking, waking up, thinking, putting a bet on? Before a football game, after a football game, chatting to someone, are you constantly thinking when you can put the next bet on? Yeah, yeah. Constantly figuring out how I can get my money back. Because it's like, because I come from very humble beginnings, mm. money for me was so important, yeah. you know? And I was like, I could have changed this life, I could have changed that life. Yeah. You know, I built schools in Africa, I could have built another school, I could yeah. have done this. And that was why I just tortured myself, tortured myself with what I could have done, what I should have done. Looked after all my family when I first made it pro. And then a lot of it was then going. It's yeah. like the guilt, the mm. shame. I can't, I can't emphasize that enough. I need it back. I need it back. Let me just get it back and give it. So it was never like, let me get it back and, and buy a fancy watch. Yeah. Never owned a watch. Yeah. Never, uh, got Same. Yeah. Maybe yeah. I've never, yeah, you know, yeah. so it's never been like that. It's never mm. been like, let me go and buy that Ferrari. Mm. Never, never been interested. It was always just about what I could actually do to support people with it. Mm. 2012. Tell mm. me about the Olympics representing Great Britain. Olympics was an unbelievable experience. That was I a bet. real yeah, in that, London. Yeah, some that, of that. Yeah, that was a real high. Yeah. Like, I've been in Olympic Village, met LeBron James, uh, saw Kobe Bryant at the time, refused a photo of anybody actually. But uh, <laughs> LeBron stopped for everybody. Yeah. Um, Kobe is obviously very famous for having mm. that mindset of just like he's in his zone, stay mm. away. Uh, being a part of that, just yeah. just like incredible. Um, the open ceremony in London, all of that stuff. So that that felt great. That felt special. And then I got to play. We played the first game, Old Trafford, Wembley, Millennium Stadium. So great experiences. We lost on penalties yeah. just before the the sort of uh, I think the medal stage, maybe one stage before mm. it. I was devastated. Mm. What I've, what I've, what I've done to have a medal, but um, representing Great Britain at the Olympics, yeah. in your home city, yeah. Unreal. That's that, a creme that, de la creme, right? Yeah, that was an unbelievable experience. Yeah. yeah. What of, faces were playing in your squad then? Ryan Giggs. Yes, yeah, with Ryan. Oh, I forgot yeah. he was playing, wasn't he? Yeah, with Ryan Giggs, with Craig Bellamy, uh, Mika Richards, yeah. obviously the big TV person yeah. nowadays. Um, wow, Daniel Sturridge. Yeah, we had a lot of a lot of top players. Ramsey. How are those four or five you just mentioned there? Who was the toughest to play against? To play against, uh, like if you were marking Giggsy back in the day. Yeah. Did you find it easier or harder to mark him than you would do sort of? 
Ibrahimovic or or well, Ib- Ibra is one of the toughest players to play against. So the two toughest players I've played against are Guerrero. Just he's just so smart. He's always on his shoulder. I mean, he's chopped me silly three or four times. <laughs> like, I'm sure you, you can probably find it on the archive somewhere. I want to go hunting after this. Have a look. Please don't. Please don't. <laughs> he just gets in the box. He does that fake chop, fake chop, and then just rolls in the ball corner. He was nightmare for me because yeah. I'm tall. Yeah, he's so small. He's got that long. What is he? Five, of five, ten, or something? Is he? Or maybe felt less even, than felt that? Felt even smaller next yeah. to me. If I was smaller, yeah. and. and it's just that low center of gravity. He could twist and turn, obviously much quicker than mm. I can. So I felt super slow playing against him. Um, he was amazing. And then Zlatan offered something very different, but just physically, I think the best player I've played against yeah. in the sense that normally when you're that big, I prefer him because mm. like me, you can't move as quick. He was rapid. And he's never he's never been known for being as quick as what he is, but he is rapid. Wow. And obviously technically, for such a big guy, technically he's very, He's an unbelievable very, player, right? Yeah. Yeah, played yeah. everywhere and smashed it everywhere he's been. Everywhere. And yeah. and wh- when did you when did you move? Was it Southampton you were at? When did you move to Liverpool? What Straight year? After Southampton. And that what year was that? In twenty sixteen ish. Yeah. What was the period after the Olympics as, before we get to that twenty sixteen period? Yeah. What would you what were you QPR, doing then? QPR. Was that yeah. when they won the Prem? Yeah. So I rushed. I rushed out of Tottenham. I forced a move out of Tottenham because to you were go. still on loan at the time of different clubs. Yeah, and yeah. I, I I went back to Tottenham. Spent yeah. that year with Gareth Bale, where he was absolutely incredible. We finished fifth in the Premier League. Great year. Played twenty seven games. In my head, needs to be forty seven. It wasn't enough. Um, the manager's an arsehole, He's this. He's that. I was immature. Well, you were saying the manager was. Yeah. And I who was, was the manager at the time? Andre Villas Boas. Okay. Um, I was so immature. Just I had that mindset of like, why am I not playing? Why I used to go knock on his door? Why am I not playing? I don't understand. Like, yeah. why have you done this? Why have you done that? He says to me, "You're young. You to be patient." I said, "Are you? Are you young? Uh, so are you patient? How young you are? You're one of the youngest managers in the Premier League. In fact, he was the youngest yeah. manager. Are you patient? How are you telling me that? Like, so it used to be that kind of approach of like, the world's against me. He's against me. All of that that comes yeah. with it, and that doesn't do myself any favors no, to play. Not. That doesn't. It doesn't make. Mm. They make him think. I'll put Steve in the next mm. game. He thinks. I'll fuck Stephen off. Yeah. You know, and that was kind of the cycle that I was in. And uh, obviously later on, I mean now I have a good relationship, you know, it's later on yeah. where I start to go, what was I doing? Yeah. But it was just so fixated and impulsive of just like, I want to play, I want to play, I want to play, I want to mm. play. There was no bigger picture for me. It was all about just wanting to put the shirt on. And part of that's great. Mm. Part of that, you know, because a lot of players, someone was just there for the money. Yeah. I'm not that guy. I wanted to play. Um so I forced a, a, a move through at the end of the year. I remember sat on a boat. Daniel Levy, the boat was in hell, out of this world, unbelievable. It was in Bahamas. Yeah. We got taken on an end of season trip. Uh, well, was, all the players got taken to Bahamas end of yeah, season trip. Yeah, Joe Lewis, who's the actual yeah, the owner. owner, owner yeah, 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 yeah. He owns a place in Bahamas. He's um, caked, isn't he? Ridiculous. Mm. Yeah. So we're there on this 300, I think it was, I said it's 300 million pound yacht <laughs> with 300 million pounds worth of artwork inside, right? So you're talking the top of the top. And I'm sat there with Daniel Levy and he says to me, your behavior this week's been an absolute disgrace. You know, uh, the owner wants to just tear your contract up. Understandably so. I was steaming for the whole the whole time. Disgrace, blackout, all of that. And I uh, I was sat there like almost angry, just angry at him for what he was saying. But then at the same time, got the guilt and the shame from the, from yeah. the, you know, the alcohol. So I'm kind of like not really knowing what I've done. Mm. So I'm... But well, eggshells almost, mm. you know. And uh, he said to me, look, I could offer you a deal. You know, you were two games away from getting another year extension. I'm going to give you that year extension. I'm going to increase your money and this would be your deal. And uh, I was like, don't want it. Don't want it. I, I, I want to go and play. I want to go and play. This manager doesn't respect me. I want to go and play. And I, I, I was forcing for a movie. He said to me, and I never forget his words because it's mm. never, been, never been a true word. He said, if you leave here, I promise you you're only going to go lower. That's, that's what's going to happen to you. You're going to go lower. And uh, I said, honestly, Daniel, I, I, sw- I went out, I went out. And uh, I did, I forced for a move to newly promoted Cardiff. And uh, it was a great first experience, became the captain, uh, scored in that derby and we mm. won. Everything was, was was flying, it was amazing. Great city, great yeah. fans. As soon as it turned, which it did turn because the club had some off the field issues. And uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer came in as manager yeah. at Christmas when we were 10th or 11th at the time. Yeah. We lost every single game. Uh, under Oli? Under Oli, we were we were dreadful. We were dreadful. So, I, I mean, I, the win percentage must have been, well, that, yeah. because we finished 20th uh, at the end of the season. So, uh, not, not, not not down to him. He, no. was, he was, I think, probably inexperienced at the time mm. as well. He later went on to manage United. Great guy, thought being nice could help everybody, yeah. but it doesn't quite work yeah. like that. Um, 
And that's it. That's where the trouble starts. You're relegated. So all of a sudden, I've gone from England, Tottenham, this, to you're relegated. You know, you're a championship player now. And then what team I go to next is then obviously affected by yeah. by that. So Especially being a defender as well. Exactly. Because yeah. I'm in a team that's conceded yeah. a lot of goals, yeah. you know. So um, that was where the career went. What year was this? 2014. And it was all, it was all my own doing. Yeah. I look back now and I, I'm sat there. Tottenham offered me a five-year deal. They offered you a five-year deal. It was a five-year deal. I already I did three years on it already. Yeah, and it's, it's they were a double. We'll, we'll, how much? Did, how much were you on a week at Tottenham at peak? Um, twenty thousand a week. Twenty so it wasn't, wasn't mega money. Well, yeah. <laughs> no, but no, I mean, no, not mega money. Oh, oh, yeah, in football terms. Did it he? Wasn't. Did he increase that to anything? Yeah, like he offered me. He offered me thirty grand a week. Thirty, and you went, no, yeah. I want out. Yeah. Want and out. did Cardiff come in and pay more? Yeah. And what did they pay you at that time? Uh, Forty grand a week. Forty grand. Okay. Yeah. And do you think him? I want more money as well as playing. Or were you thinking I want more money so I can gamble? No, the gambling never came into it. No, okay. it never. It was just like uh, I felt Tottenham had mugged me off. I said okay. I, I felt I, I saw. I looked around. Obviously, I know players at that age were on sixty, seventy grand a week who hadn't done anything that I'd done yeah. at, that, at, that, at that stage. You know, I, I was I was flying really in terms of on the pitch. So uh, I felt mugged off and all that stuff again. And you were what twenty three at this age, roughly? Nah, twenty one. Twenty one still. Twenty one. Yeah, but Bloody I just. Hell. I was just filled, my head was filled with nonsense, you know what I mean? And it was just kind of like, nothing was ever enough. Mm. It was always, I wanted more, I wanted more. Uh, and mostly, what I look back now, I just wanted respect. Yeah. And I just never felt quite like I had that from Tottenham. Um, but you have to earn respect, yeah, right? And my foot, well, my performances over the course of the four years I'd been on loan and stuff yeah. like that <clears throat> had probably earned respect. But my behaviour when drinking or gambling yeah. was what lost the respect. Yeah. And I guess that was, that was the battle I faced. So... It's all on me. Mm. I, I say to every young player I speak to, patience, patience, patience. I know you want to play. Great. Keep that. Keep that fire burning. Yeah. But there's a way to it. So um, that's my uh, mm. my ultimate regret is my whole career. I was so impulsive, was never patient, thought I knew best. And yeah, so that. Does that cause a problem in a team changing room? <clears throat> Knowing you're on 20 bags a week. He's on 40, he's on 60. I'm actually a better player than him, but he's on 60 grand. Why are they mugging me for 20? Yeah. I should be on the same. Does that cause a problem in the changing room? People definitely feel it. Yeah. yeah. It's definitely a thing. You know, it's different when you, Gareth Bale was there on 100, whatever. It's Gareth it? Bale. Yeah. Right? It's top of the top. Yeah. But if you're looking and go, well, hold on, I play more games than Dawson or, yeah. or whatever at the time, and he's on 50, 60, and I'm yeah. on. You know, there'd definitely be moments like that. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't say it was ever, it was never any bitterness towards the player. It was more just like when you're arguing Comparing the owner. Yourself, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. You, you have definitely a comparison there. Well, hold on. I was on that and I'm on this. Mm. There would definitely be that moment, yeah. What was Gareth Bale like as a player at Tottenham when you were there? Unbelievable. Literally, it was, yeah, he was, that was the year where, the year before Madrid brought him, he was absolutely insane. So, and I used to just be like, because Villas Boas, obviously me and him were fighting. Yeah. And I'd be thinking, well, you're going to lose this game anyway. You're going to lose. And then there'd be one nil down with like five minutes to go and Bale <laughs> pops up with <laughs> two. He just sat there and I see Villas Boas turn around hugging everyone. And I'd be like, guys, oh, guys, guys. You know, just be like, what's, what's going on? <laughs> so I'll be on the bench next week and yeah. I'll be thinking, cheers, cheers, guys. Yeah, yeah. appreciate that. But, but yeah, again, okay, like, just unbelievable to actually see it first and be on the pitch mm. on, on occasions as well we did it West Ham away uh, last minute yeah I remember oh, oh. unbelievable so we were gutted your West Ham yeah, yeah mate yeah. we were properly gutted yeah so like there's moments where it was great I was on the pitch yeah. and there's moments where I was I was on the, in the stand or on the bench thinking oh, you've saved mm. him a game you've mm. saved him a game so what was your movements after Tottenham then the Southampton yeah so I went straight to Cardiff yep. Cardiff got relegated then I went to QPR. just on that Cardiff thing yeah. there you ain't going to give me a proper answer here, but I'm going to throw it out to you. Yeah. Who are the better set of fans, Cardiff or Swansea? No, I couldn't give you an answer to you. <laughs> I was I throwing you Yeah, no, I couldn't. No, I couldn't give you an answer because... They're both right. proper set of fans, aren't really, they? Really, yeah. really, really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Both yeah. of them, like, they're really passionate. Yeah. So when you go to Wales, you know you what there. it's about. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So honestly, like, I uh, do you mean that? Yeah. I was great experience with yeah. both. A lot of teams now, it's, it's changed, isn't it? Atmosphere is rubbish at games, but South Wales, yeah, proper atmosphere. And then Southampton, do you enjoy your time at Southampton? No. 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 How long were you there for? Uh, only six months under Koeman. The guy didn't know my name for sure. He didn't know my Ronald name. Ronald Koeman, the legend, yeah, the, yeah, the Dutch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't know my name, 100%. He wanted to sign Van Dijk. That's what they were waiting for. And they did sign Van Dijk. But for some bizarre reason, they signed me in the interim. 
don't know why that was to be fair I still don't know to this day what that was about but went there uh, started quite well first few games thought I played well and then uh, got dropped um, obviously when Van Dyke came in I'm sat behind Van Dyke and Jose Fonte two top 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 players um, and I self-destructed and then by the time I got my next opportunity I was horrendous worst game of my life we lost 6-1 to Liverpool um, and it was just yeah then I was just I was a disgrace you know what I mean I look back like oh, just what was that you know what I mean like, it was an opportunity yeah, mm. okay the guy didn't know your name and he obviously wasn't I wasn't his cup of tea but um, I was too busy fixated on the injustice of when I started quite well and then he just stripped me of all my comp why did he do that you know and I was kind of caught on that but then what happened was I proved his point because I was crap and then he can say, well, this is why you're not playing, because look at you, you know what I mean? And that was kind of the cycle. But I then got the move to Liverpool off the back of getting beat 6-1, having the worst game of my life. How, so, how on earth did you lose 6-1 and how on earth did you get signed for Liverpool at no the time? Like, that's the most mad thing I've ever seen in my life. I don't know what like, what went on. Yeah, Again, it, was, it would have been behind the scenes because I very much doubt Klopp, when he first came to Liverpool, went, I want Stephen Corker. Yeah. I know who I want. January signing. That guy who we lost six, I want him. Yeah, I very much doubt <laughs> that was what's going through his mind if I wanted. So there would have been some arrangement behind the scenes. But I'm kind of the, the puppet, if you like, because I'm my world's falling apart. I'm an absolute mess. Um, and I'm kind of like the agents just call you, got move there. You're never going to turn down a move to Liverpool. Mm. You know what I mean? I've jumped, ran to Liverpool. Um, and I was, I was, I was, again, I was. I want to say I was treated a little bit harsh there. You know, but I think that Klopp kind of, you know, I'm not his player. He put me on a couple of times up front. Great, great memories, amazing, great connection. Put you on up front? Yeah, put me on up front. And, uh, did he know you were a central defender? He, uh, probably not. Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> That's probably, probably, probably why he did it. He thought I was his new striker yeah. coming in. So, um, uh, great, like, great experience, great memories. It's yeah. a great connection with the fans. But uh, I played one game as, as centre half, did okay, got injured. Um, ahead of the second leg against West Ham it was against yeah. West Ham it was yeah, in the FA Cup got injured went to him said look my back's in spasm I can't get right I was desperate to play as I said that's one thing throughout my career I've always wanted to play uh, and he kind of just wrote me off from that moment so I felt that's probably a little bit harsh at the time I didn't really I didn't understand why, but uh, his players have got back fit it's like, you've got seven, seven and seven halves at the time mm. you know all seven of them have got back fit and I just got brushed aside and I actually ended up in rehab um, during that period because it was like I think everything just come to a head and I was like I need to go back to rehab the drink is out of hand I'm blacking out every time I pick up a drink don't know what's going on I'm gambling numbers that I, I can't afford um, and I just felt really I mean suicidal you yeah. know at that point there, was, there wasn't much left to give you know uh, everything everything had been taken from me the relationships the trust the, the money the opportunities it was all just fizzling away so I went to my second stint in rehab and still wasn't ready Wow when you were at Liverpool did you get imposter syndrome that all of a sudden you got from Southampton on loan all of a sudden I'm playing in front of the cop for Liverpool one of the greatest clubs in the world you mentioned it earlier about being on trial. Mm. That's that's probably one. Of, I don't even know whether you even knew what you were saying or, mm. or the real meaning behind mm. it. I, again, I was on trial mm. because it's now I'm here to prove myself that I'm good enough to be Liverpool. You know, I mean, it's like I have to prove that that was just a bad game at Southampton. I need to prove it. So it's that constant. So definitely, I had imposter syndrome. What am I doing here? Like, I'm not good enough to be here, and, and which is mad because mm. you know Hendo. I played with him at England. Uh, Jordan Milner, Henderson. Yeah, yeah, Jordan Henderson, Adam Lallana, James Milner, Daniel Sturridge. Half the team I played with. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's mad that I, I'm there going, I'm not good enough to be here. I'm not good enough to be here. Because uh, it, it, at times, I certainly was. Maybe not at that moment, but there's been times in my career where I was. But because that, that belief was just like, it was just gone. Um, which was caused by off the field and then and then it affected my on the field and then it just it spirals just down to that zero belief, zero self-confidence, walk around with my head down, just want to be out there and I want to be in the public eye. Um, dark, dark place. Mm. You mentioned there about suicidal thoughts. Have yeah. you ever thought about taking your own life? There's been definitely times where I've, I've, I've sat and thought about what I'd often do would be Googling it. I'd be Googling like, how do you do it? What's what what way? What's the way to do it where it's not going to affect your family? You know, how do you make it look like an accident? Because I don't want them to live with anyone who 
any, any, any of the survivors, you know, sub, sub, survivors of bereavement, how, any of those who are living with the fact that someone's taken their life, they always feel guilty, right? They always feel they could have done more, they should have done more, what if? What if? And I've always had that in my mind. That I never want to leave my family with that. So I've been in a lot of pain and thought it'd be much easier to be gone right now. But there's never been, a, in my head, a way of doing that without leaving my family with the burden of the stress and the pain and all that. So I've I've believed that if I do it, I would feel selfish. Um, but I've certainly looked for ways. I've, I've certainly looked for ways, yeah. Um, and it's a very complex issue. Um, I've... Uh, unfortunately lost people to suicide you know being in AA you're, you're very close to people who live, live very close to the edge and I've seen what that's done to the family so I've been very very close to it um, and it's just it's just a horrific ordeal all around you know I understand that you know it was described to me once it's not necessarily act of doing it's more an act of letting go so when you eventually do it it's your hands that you've been holding onto the bar for so long and your hands are slipping and slipping eventually you just want to let go uh, and I understand that analogy. I really understand that of like I've held onto the bar and I've been holding and holding my hands are slipping and it's like sometimes it's 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 out of your control. It's really difficult. There's a website out there, anyone listening, called Jack, J-A-A-Q. It's just yeah. ask a question, mm-hmm. J-A-A-Q dot org. Anyone thinking about doing suicidal attempts or being suicidal thoughts or have got stress or they, this website is unbelievable. Like you mentioned a minute ago, you go on Google. Google, there might be 60 pages of black and white writing. There's this new mental health app just come out now, which is phenomenal. It's going to be game-changing worldwide, global. Jack, J-A-A-Q.org. For anyone out there listening, don't, definitely go and check it out. Yeah, familiar with Jack as well. Yeah. yeah. Just going back there, what were the players you were playing with at Liverpool at the time? Stevie G? No. No? no he'd left. He'd left, has he? He'd left. I played with him in England. So I played with him in England. Suarez had just left as well. Um, so it was kind of like a transitional period at Liverpool. But and the year? Uh, well, I think 2016. 2016, okay. Yeah, I think it's 2016. But I had Coutinho, just incredible. Yeah. So you had him to feed balls into in midfield. Um, well, actually, I was at the, the front passing it back to him, weren't I? So yeah. it was, uh, <laughs> I was setting him for, for uh, yeah, one of the best I've played with. Is he? Uh, yeah, so, so, so good. He's had a little full... You know, for a little bit of a dip, but mm. he, oh, what a player, mm. which is hard for me to understand because I, I looked at him, I was like, technically, mm. and he's such a, such a clever player. Um, so you had him, you had uh, Ben Teke as well, like going through that period up front. Mm. Um, you had your Skirtle and Lover in the back. Lots and lots of good, good, good players. Um, and I mean, that year they went, I believe, to the final. Mm. Uh, I mean, I was in rehab during this period. They went to the final mm. of the Europa League. So Klopp had, a, had an instant impact, and I could see his work. Progressing, I could see tactically he was. I mean, he was on it. First three months, I was not one day off. You know, well, Jurgen Klopp was bang on it. Wasn't yeah, it? he was on it. It was three months in, not one day off. It was just it, relentless. And even on their games, you're training. You know, it was like he constantly wanted to drum home his message, um, and it was clear. And because I was always on the like the the non-start eleven, mm. so I was once playing against the eleven in training. I was finding it tougher and tougher and tougher to start to play out because their press was getting so good. Yeah. It was like us eleven who were not playing. With, how are we gonna? Can't find the gaps. So I yeah. knew. I said to a friend who's a scout. I said, they're, they're, "That's they're gonna be. They're gonna be up there." And obviously, they've gone on to win the league, Champions mm-hmm. League, and so on. Like it, it wasn't like, "Oh, I've got such a great insight." It was. Mm. It was obvious. I mean, you could see it. What did you see in Klopp that you haven't seen in other managers? Um, well, tactically, to begin with, I'd say just that, like, I mean, that just constant over and over and over and over the same message. It was really important for me to see that as I sort of embark on my managerial journey. I, I definitely took a lot from that. That It was just, it doesn't happen overnight. It just goes bit by bit yeah. by bit. Um, and also, like, obviously, his man management skills, mostly the players that were playing. But obviously, he treated everyone as one, treats the, the, the kitchen staff, the cleaners, everyone is together as one, the groundsman, because that's what brings together a club. There's no point. And, uh, Many managers seem to get this wrong. There's no point you as a manager treating me well because I'm one of your star men, but you treat the sub mm. like a piece of shit. Mm. You don't say good morning to the to the staff at the ground. That, that, I've got no respect for you, like yeah. just because you treat me with respect. Like I want to see and feel that everybody is a part of it because those people behind the scenes, trust me, when managers come out and say that about the people behind the scenes, bring it together. They really do. You see the kit man, the physio. 
they are the ones so important yeah. at clubs. They bring, bring it all together. together. Yeah, because when you're downtime, when you're off the pitch and you want to have a little natter or a little mm. moan or whatever, they're the ones who hold you. I mean, they they got such an important role. Um, and they feel a part of it when the manager's including them. So mm. I think it's really important. Cool, and yeah. what's it like playing in front of the cop? Yeah, unreal, unreal experience. Yeah, especially we, when I made my debut up front, we equalised uh, against Arsenal, so it's free, free. Uh, it was like insane. Electric. The place just erupted. Yeah, it's an incredible feeling. Tell me about how you ended up getting your first England, your first full England cap. Yeah, so I, I think I'd been in the squad before, but didn't play. I believe um, Roy Hodgson had. had Call me up. It was uh, against Sweden, against Latan. So it was, what is that? It was, when Slatan scored four? Yeah, it's when he scored four. <laughs> well, yeah. So, yeah. So I actually scored, but it's overshadowed. It's, oh, it's, 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 yeah. So it's, you scored a New England debut. It's scored a New England oh, debut. Mate, yeah, result. exactly. That's what I'm saying. No yeah. one knows. It was, yeah. it was. It was. It was the. It was a Latin show. Yeah. Um, it was just mad. So I, I uh, left the pitch at two one. We're winning two one. Mm with 10 minutes or so to go. Uh, it just then, like, Slatan just scored another three. They win 4-2. Debut's gone. Forgot about yeah. it. Like, it was just, it was just like a, a surreal moment where I had 80 minutes in. I'm like, oh my God, we were in 2-1 against Sweden. This is my debut. I'd scored all that. And then within 10 minutes, it was like, Slatan show. Oh, it was man. it was done because the next day it would have been about you, wouldn't it? The winner on his <laughs> debut, and it would have, but instead it was about his bicycle. It's a shout out to like, Slatan, thanks, mate. For yeah, that. that's it, exactly. Yeah, for 40 yards, he's gone bicycle. That's right, like, that was yeah. an um, that's one of the best goals ever, isn't it? Ever, ever, ever. yeah. So, again, great experience to be involved. Um, I, I didn't, I wouldn't say I took it all in, I didn't, it just kind of took it for granted mm -hmm. onto the next one, onto the next one. Um, it was only like now, obviously, looking back, I'm like, wow, I played for England, great yeah. honor, you know. But how old were you when you made your debut? 20. 20. Yeah, 20. So that's what I'm saying. It's like from 15 when I first got signed by Tottenham. Happened so quickly. Five years, like boom. You know, I'd gone through League One, Championship, Premier League, back at Tottenham, playing for England. It was like, played in the Olympics all in five years. Yeah. Crazy. And then and then Liverpool, how did the sort of Liverpool thing come to an end? Yeah, well, I went to rehab. I went to rehab and I just cut it short. So um, I left, went to rehab. It didn't really work out. Walked out of rehab. Just felt that was kind of over the same message that I'd already, already understood yeah. but couldn't do anything about. So if I had a pound for every uh, therapist that said to me, "You're like you've got such good knowledge, so you're already halfway there," mm. I feel I'd probably have my money back from gambling yeah. because they all say the same thing to me. Mm. I've got the understanding, but it's applying it. You know, I couldn't apply it, so it was irrelevant. Knowing it made me feel worse. Mm. I knew the process. I knew my triggers. I knew my cycle, but. I'm going back round it. So I walked out, uh, again, probably the wrong decision, but I, I, I can't change it. How old are you at that time? 24. 24? Yeah. This is all happened so quickly, right? Yeah. My so, God. So, so 24, you're yeah. checking yourself into rehab yeah. for your second time. Yeah. Give me an example so the listeners can understand and watch us on YouTube. What is rehab? Rehab, I want to call it a safe space. Uh, for someone who's struggling with addiction to go and firstly get clean because sobriety is the, the number one start of it all. Putting down the drink isn't going to change your life, but it, it gives you yeah. the, the stepping stone, uh, a place where then you can start to learn about yourself, understand your triggers, why, what, how, and then hopefully if you stay long enough, unlike myself, you then get the tools to learn how to then deal with it going forward. Um, it's very much a bubble that they, they put you in. Um, it's not somewhere you go and sleep, you know, it's active, you're up, you're up early, you're doing this, you're doing that, no phones, you know, no distractions, no outside, it's there, you're on it, you know, you spend time with the horses, you spend time at the spa, spend time uh, doing like a little golf thing, you know, just little things like mm -hmm. that, that are like bringing you back to, okay, you know what, being with nature, doing things that you can you can do on a, on a Sunday, you don't need to go and drink, you know, just trying to break the habits and show you new doors and what works for you. For example, I think we did cricket, or we did scuba diving, scuba diving mm -hmm. at one point. Um, does that work for you? Is that something you find a passion in? You know, just finding yeah. new things, a little bit of everything. So you can start to find, actually, I quite enjoyed that. I didn't realize I did, but I enjoyed the cricket. I want to go out and play cricket now. Yeah. So little tasters, um, and mostly what you take is the tools, the tools to be able to cope day to day. And is that to trigger your mind to go, before I'm about to have a bet, actually, I don't want to do that. I want to go and walk around the field for an hour and a half just to stop you gambling. Yeah, it's, it's also feeling time. Because if you think as a gambler, most of my time is taken by, by, by gambling. You know, so it's like giving me stuff to put in place. I mean, my what 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 I mean, my tools today to stop myself from gambling. Uh, firstly, I give away 
uh, access to all my funds. So, you know, my parents have access to my funds, my girlfriend, whatever it may be. So I don't, I can't access the funds easily. There's yeah. always a way, yeah. by the way. There's always yeah. a way. But uh, it's hard. It's restricted. Bar myself from all the bookies, casinos in the UK. So there's no access there. If so I wanna, you've barred yourself? Yeah, self-excluded. So if I want to go anywhere, I have to go abroad, uh, which again, I've done. So it's not a case of I won't do it, but it's harder to yeah. find the time to go abroad. Um, I do my my Gamblers Anonymous program, so I go to the meetings. I'll you know share with like minded individuals. That's probably where my biggest my biggest relief comes from. Just sharing, Giving back. yeah, just yeah. sharing with others my experience, hearing their experience, helping them through that process gives me a purpose, gives me a reason to want to continue. Um, and then the 12 steps, so the 12 steps where I've gone through, gone through my resentments, gone through uh, the powerlessness over my addiction. Yeah. Um, and then and I've made amends, which by the way is- That's powerful. That was, <sighs> that was freeing. What step is the amends? It's step four or five? No, I step four is the resentment. Resentment, yeah. yeah. And then making the actual amends, I would say seven or eight. Seven or uh, eight. Yeah. And so. that's the bit there where you've got to go back and apologize to people yeah. or stuff that we've lied. Yeah. Was, was lying a big part of your gambling Absolutely. addiction? Does does biggest part, yeah. So I would lie all the time, all the time. Feed my addiction, feed my addiction. In the, f I thought I was protecting them, um, which I, I could still understand why. You know, I could look back and go, I understand it because I don't want to. I want to protect my family, loved ones from the pain of all of what I'm actually doing. But it just made matters worse. They're mm. not stupid. They know it. They sense it. They feel it. Especially, especially women. Yeah, mate. They spot it. <laughs> <I'll> <laughs> tell you, don't they? Just, it's like they just yeah. feel it in their waters. They yeah. just know, like, been gambling. Yeah. You know, and it's like I was very, very good at hiding it. Like I've got, a, I've got a switch like that, and you could just see me go, yeah, like that, and I'm straight into TV mode. Oh, da, 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 like, but they could feel it; mm. they could definitely feel it. And um, and I would just lie. And what I did was ultimately steal their instinct, which is the, the probably the thing I feel most guilty for because my mom, my girlfriend, of course, they knew that I've been up to no good. But I would steal their instinct. I would convince them, and I've become so good at convincing them that even though they knew deep down, yeah. It's like, well, I've got all this evidence to prove that I haven't gambled. Yeah. You know, so it become manipulative, all of that stuff. And making amends was hard. Yeah. Um, everyone but bar two people accepted really? my amends. Yeah, yeah. And those two people didn't accept it. You drew the money? No, 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 no. no. Not, I'm not due anyone money. No, no, no. So I'd always cleared all you my debts cleared to debt. everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why do you think those two people were not accepting? Um, well, it's personal to them. Um, I, my thoughts are that they feel it's, it's a load of bullshit. Um, you're still the same person. You you, you can't change. Uh, I've heard it all before. That's that's how I I project that that yeah. their feelings because uh, I would have tried four or five times to apologise and and I would have fallen back into it. So they're thinking that ah, it's only a matter of time before you go again, before you go again. So that's that's why I assume they they act that mm. way. But uh, I can't control you it. You can't that's control okay. it. Yeah. That's, that's, and that's you know okay. what? What you've done is to make the amends is a powerful thing to do. Yeah. Really powerful. Yeah. How many people on that list were there? Wow, uh, over a hundred. Yeah, over a hundred football clubs, football managers, uh, players, teammates, friends, school friends, family. Uh, yeah, it was a hell of a lot of people on that list. A um, lot of women, you know, because a lot of women, because I just, you know, when I'm in active addiction, I'm in blackout. Just, you know, I had, a, I didn't feel that I'd ever treated them right. Yeah. You know, and I just felt that I needed to go back and and, and apologize for that and, and own my part. In, in all of it because I could say oh, oh, it's a disease I could say I'm ill but ultimately I was still the person behind it I still did it and I take responsibility for that mm. um, really freeing I, and I always felt that you know most people welcomed it with open arms because they always went I knew you were different like they knew that even though they might have seen the worst side of me they also knew that deep down I wasn't that guy uh, which always been quite pleasing to hear yeah. that people know they could sense it right they could sense that I'm not an out and out arsehole. Yeah. Um, I might have been a newspaper for this, that and the other, but that's not really who I am deep mm. down. But also if you don't know what addiction is like, some people won't understand what a gambling addiction actually does and affects you personally, right? Yeah, yeah. So they got to get their head around to understand what is actually going through your head. Yeah, to understand. To like, understand what's yeah, going on. Yeah, because why? Because logically, you just wouldn't do it, right? Yeah. If you if you get stung on the hot stove, you don't put your hand there yeah. again. I'm just I'm holding my hand there, you know what I mean? I'm constantly doing it. So. It's difficult. I think it's 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 a very complex uh, illness. Mm -hmm. I think that it's becoming more and more popular, yeah. um, which on one hand is good because people become more aware, but on the other hand, it's a fucking disaster because yeah. there's more and more people getting sick from it. Um, I, I read the other day that it's percentage-wise mm. that it's it's the addiction where most people commit suicide. Yeah. 
it's it's, it's the hidden the ratio. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know horrendous. what the suicide rate is? Uh, one in four. Mm. I'm just reading one in four. So alcohol compulsive gamblers one in four, which is which Mate. is a hell of a lot. Imagine getting yourself like I, I guess you were the question asked a minute ago about you being paying everyone back. Well, you you were lucky. You probably had the funds to go right. I'm going to shift that yeah. to you. There's twenty juice for you, five juice, whatever it may be, yeah. borrowing. But there's a lot of people I've interviewed. So not a lot of people. There's a few I've interviewed who are still due the money back to yeah, people yeah. and had to make the amends like you and get acceptance of people yeah. and put them on a direct debit, even if you're paying like 10 quid a month to one person, 10 quid, and, but they can't afford it. That, yeah. that must be even tougher. It takes a lot of humility. Yeah. A lot of humility. A lot of, uh, I mean, the biggest word for me is acceptance. Acceptance. To yeah. accept that, you know what, the career I had's gone, the money I had gone, the opportunities I had have gone, the relationships have gone. And here I am today, um, trying to earn an honest living and, it takes a lot of humility to to accept that it's not quite how it was. Mm -hmm. uh, I struggle with it at times, to be honest. I think that's probably my biggest battle today is around the acceptance. When I go, I mean, I do commentating now, for example, mm -hmm. and I go and watch a game, and I'm like, wow, oh, I played with him, played with him, yeah. played with him, played with him. You know, it's it's a real struggle for me uh, walking away from that game. When I'm in the moment, I'm, I said, I'm on. It's almost like you're on your yeah. show. But yeah. I walk away, I go home, and I'm like, Jesus. I could have had that, mm. you know. I might not have stayed in the Premier League, but I could have been in, you know, yeah. top of the Championship. Could have been in a league abroad, and uh, I mean, I've had it, and I, I got it back. I think you would have been. I back. think I think you would have been top of the Premier League. You know, everyone was talking about you, but you, like, how it would be interesting to see how much that f well, affected you massively, obviously, but yeah. how much that affected to not get you to where you are today at the age of what thirty one. Yeah. Like you could still be up there playing. Oh, even now, looking for know? a team right now. Like you're in no, great no. nick, and like. Yeah. Like you yeah. say, I played with him, played with him. I'm just as good as him. I'm as good as him. Yeah. But you went down the gambling route, and yeah, and 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 that's probably the cruelest thing about addiction. Yeah, it's like you're watching life fall before you. Yeah, without really being in control of it. And uh, I struggle with that. I, I, that's that's the that's the truth. You know, I struggle with that. You know, I, I I'm still depressed. I I take antidepressants. I have to work daily at, at trying to come out of that depression because. I so often just fall back into it. You know, I think oh, I often think I'll go live on an island yeah. and just shut off from the mm -hmm. world, but it doesn't really feel like my calling, doesn't really feel my purpose. I, I feel helping people is something that gives me that feeling of I'm fulfilling yeah. my purpose, but I want to play. Mm. I want to play, you know, I, 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 I want to be a manager. That's my my ultimate goal. But um, whilst I'm 31 and I'm doing my badges, mm. I feel oh, I want to play, I yeah. want to play. But I reach out to teams. And you get that cold shoulder. Uh, some some managers are cool, and they're yeah. just like, look. Well, do they? Work. They'll look at it and go, "Oh, he's been alone, 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 alone. He's got an addiction. Yeah, he's been gambling addiction. Yeah. Do we want? Do we want to risk bringing him into the yeah, club? Exactly. Even though you're a beautiful yeah. human being and yeah. kind and loving and a solid player, yeah. Do you reckon that overshadows it? Absolutely. A bit? Yeah. 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 So they can't trust me, or they feel they can't trust me, and yeah, that's it. That hurts. Because it's like no matter how many times you try to put your, mm. you know, one foot from the other, it just doesn't quite happen. Um, but that might be my story, and my story might be that I go and study for the next five years as a manager, as I've started on that journey. And you might be the and I, the best manager around. Might happen. Might mm. happen. You know, I've got to believe it. Yes, yeah. they're well, certainly not going to yeah. believe it. The fans aren't going to believe it. Yeah. So that's that's come from me, and uh, I believe in terms of the communication and all of what I've seen from various of managers, yeah. top top managers that. I could be the best, yeah. um, and then tactically, I need a lot of lot of catching up to mm. do, you know. But that's what I, I go and study, you know. Mm. I said I just I don't know off the top of my head. Mm. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely parts of of something there. Is there managers out there? Obviously, if, I don't know what sort of wedge you're on now, but that's just argument's sake. You're on ten grand a week, mm -hmm. just for argument's sake, twenty grand a week, whatever it may be. Is there managers out there again? I don't want to take the risk because I've got to sign a year's contract with him. And if he's halfway through the season and he has a chip on his shoulder or he gets the ump or something, he's off. We're going to lose him. Is there no way you can go in there and do his pay as you play? Yeah, I've tried that. You've done that? I've tried that. I've tried that. <laughs> I've definitely tried okay. that. Because I think the same as you. Yeah. I start to think, well, I would put myself in their shoes. Yeah. Well, what's their yeah. concerns? But it's it doesn't seem to be about that. Mm. It's, it's it's still there won't be. Nah, I can't. If you look at how many players are out of contract, yeah. Right, there's a lot of players out of contract, a lot. And a lot of us, have, uh, let's say, got a big mouth. Yeah. We we speak the truth. Yeah. And uh, I think a lot of clubs, because I think it could get like seven people to sign off. So Say get, that again. Go back, go back, about seven people to, to sign, sign off. off. What, to sign a player? Yeah. Okay. It's not just, okay. so I've had loads of managers that go, I, I fancy let's have you, him. Jeremy, let's bring him So in. Harry would go to 
Joe Levy, Joe, um, Joe Levy, yeah, and yeah, go. Joe, Joe Lewis, Daniel Joe, Levy, sorry, Daniel yeah, Levy, and yeah. go. Right, I'll, I want him. Let's yeah. go, and it would happen. I'd imagine. Back in the day. Back in the day. Yeah. What we're saying now is there's about six or seven people oh, who got some. Yeah, yeah. Right, okay. Absolutely impossible. Impossible. So I've had in the last three months maybe twenty teams come and approach me and say, "Want to sign me?" So they start that cycle. Process. Yeah. Want to start? Want to sign? Great. Excited. My missus thinks we're moving here. We're moving there. By the end of it, you know, get to the fourth guy. Nah. Don't want him. Oh, Jeremy, the fourth mate. guy Googles him and says, nah, I'm not touching oh, him. Mate. And then that's how it kind of happens. Yeah, so okay. so many so it's not just a case if you sit there, the phone don't ring. The phone often rings. Yeah. But once they get down the, the, the process, the process yeah. of it, there's always someone. There must goes, be someone out there that's gonna give you an opportunity. Anyone listening out there, mate, <laughs> get Steve an opportunity. Like yeah. surely that like, would you back yourself now going to train with West Ham and be yeah. at that kind of level? You know, like yeah. would you would you back yourself? I would back myself. However, I think the Premier League's moved way forward. Yeah. I think over the last however many years, moved way forward. And I, I would I would see myself a championship player right yeah. now. I, I mean, I was there last year with Wigan. Unfortunately, yeah. never played much. Got signed under Colo Torre. He got sacked after 12, 13 days of me being there. Sean only come in. It wasn't his, his first choice. wasn't his fifth choice, to be honest with yeah. you. And, and, and it's just kind of the way it was. We had a good relationship. I worked hard every day, filled in the gaps when I was called upon. Club got relegated and and okay. it was looking for a new path now, yeah. a new journey. So, yeah, I, I, I mean, it's not about the money for me. It's I'm more about the opportunity yeah, because I, I just feel that I've never fulfilled my potential, mm. and it definitely keeps me up at night. Yeah. That sort of feeling, and that's why I'm so keen to start as a manager. I'll be honest yeah. with you, because I kind of want to put a new down, chapter yeah. and just go right. That's that's that done, but. There's still something there. So Mate, can't you goes. can't you write? Do you know a minute ago we go right? Oh, manager goes, a foreign manager comes in and they Google it and did it and they go yeah, yeah 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 down the step and then we start. Get yourself to China. China. Who's yeah. going to Google China? Who's going to be able to read everything that's going on? They all do. Oh, they, they all do. They all do. No matter where you go, honestly, really? they all. It's all a process, yeah. Or mm. it's about the agent and the agent does. That, okay. But I've been down that route. I you tried all. Have you tried a lot of fun? Have you played abroad? Yeah, played abroad. Played done four years in Turkey. Done four years in Turkey. So I four could, years in Turkey? Yeah, what was that like? Um, incredible. Completely rebuilt myself. Uh, everything was incredible. After two and a half years, I'd been in team of the year, two years running. Uh, I was a new man. I was sober. Everything was amazing. Moved to Fenerbahce and it all went downhill from there. Yeah. I, so you went, you went to sign for Fenerbahce, did you? Yeah. I had, One of the biggest clubs in Turkey. Yeah, I had all of them. And I chose to go to Fenerbahce. Uh, Why? Oh, God no. So I asked myself every single day because it was only two years ago and that's, that's what, again, like, so so my career, that, that, that. Yeah. And, and, and this time, I don't even know how. It's a blink of an eye. Tell me that so, Tell me that club you just said you meant to go in Turkey, the one you went to? I went to Alanya Spor. Alanya Spor. And what are they? Are they in the top division? Yeah, top division. Uh, you did two and a half years there. Yeah. What made you go, actually, I fancy Fenerbahce? Someone approach you or did you get an opportunity? Yeah, I was approached or? by, I was, I was, I ran out of contract. Yeah. So that club had also okay. offered me a new deal. But, I mean, they, they were they were a top five team. Yeah. So it was, it was good. We played in Europe and stuff like that. Yeah. But Besiktas came calling. They were Champions League. Uh, Trabs on Spor, who then won the league that next yeah. season. Galatasaray had conversations. Someone there didn't want to sign that off. <clears throat> and then Fenerbahce. So I was like, well, out of the four um, in Turkey, I'm like, Fenerbahce's, you know, and Galatasaray are the biggest. Yeah. I want to go to Fenerbahce. Two days in, new manager comes in. Just, I don't want him, don't want him. I mean, Turkey's nuts. Like, it's a change of, a change of management with a day. And it's like, don't want him, don't want him, don't want him. So I was one of them. And I'm just sat there like, oh my God. So I'm trying to like get myself to be Shikdas from for the back. Yeah. Shikdas like, good one. Like, you know I mean, you had the choice, we offered you free contracts and you turned them all down. You've gone there. Didn't go there for the money because yeah. everyone in Turkey is like, yeah, you, you must have gone. I'm like, I had more money on the table at Besiktas. Yeah. This is what, this is sometimes, honestly, I don't understand what went through my, but there was just an instinct in me. When I first went to Turkey, um, we, what year? What year? Uh, 2019. 19. Okay. Me and my agent spoke, and we were like, and he's my best friend. Yeah. You know I mean, he wasn't. He wasn't even an agent yeah. at the time. We brought him in, and uh, we we're like, oh, you know what the journey would be? We we'll go to Fenerbahce. At one point, we we'll go to Fenerbahce, and I was like, I'm going to be speaking Turkish in this interview, right? So I learned Turkish. <laughs> yeah, I learned Turkish. <laughs> it all come to fruition. Yeah. I was signing Fenerbahce. I'm speaking Turkish. Did a 10 minute plus interview. Signing on my signing day in Turkish, me and him have gone through that evening just like wow, like, yeah. we, like you know, all the stuff it. of people going, you picture it, and it happened. Yeah. Like, I didn't really believe it, but yeah. it happened. Yeah. 
two days in, lasted two days and uh, it all just fell apart. Um, and then I, I, I never, I still, I, today, I still haven't recovered from that. I still haven't recovered. Just the trauma of it. Trabzonspor went on to win the league. Besiktas played Champions League. Galatasaray are uh, Galatasaray, you know, they're, they're flying high. They won the league the year after. And uh, I've just been like completely dismissed. In Turkish football, it's like, ah, it's gone. The manager said I'm too slow. And as a result of that, it's not going to affect I became everyone else. too slow. Oh, you know, my. so it's uh, a difficult, a difficult process. Went alone twice, but it was, I wasn't there. I wasn't there. How so. much were you when you signed for Fenerbahce? Did they have to pay you off when I left? No, you know, you said it lasted two days. Did the contract sign? You go yeah. right. I mean, how long? Was, how many? Is it? One I year? Signed two years. Yeah. Two years. Did yeah. they have to pay you a year yeah. off? Yeah, yeah. So what they did is I went on loan that yeah. year, so to stop them paying the yeah. full whack, and they they gave me a chunk. Basically to finish to go, it off, to go to go. Go. yeah. Okay, and then I came back the next year, and then same cycle happened again. So they said, yeah, "There's another chunk, like walk away." Yeah, so I had to. I, I was like in a situation where I was like, I, like "There's no way if I'm not going to be financially compensated." Like uh, this is just a, beyond a disaster, yeah. really. So uh, people at the club they get a lot of criticism, but they were cool, you know, like the uh, the president and stuff. Like it wasn't his fault, you know. He tried to help me. Yeah. He, he brought in a manager. The manager you know, decided what he decided, but it was tough. Like I was in the press for all this being slow and I was just like, wow, like, I was in the in the best 11, two years running. Yeah. So what if I lost my ability within 48 yeah. hours? Like it's impossible. But what it did do was just affect me. So I didn't, I didn't cope well. I, I wobbled massively, relapsed. And then everything come tumbling you down. relapsed in 2019 no when I got the move so 2021 20, 21 yeah you relapsed and how long you'd been clean for uh, three years at three the years and yeah. that triggered it for you to get gambling on the booze again yeah I was gone yeah. I just I, like, I, right. I felt my whole world just came tumbling down yeah. which again in hindsight it's, it hasn't you know what I mean you're still there you still earn the right to be there you're going on loan whatever take the money but i think what about the money it's like I've, no like i'd work my because that, that process took nearly four years to rebuild yeah. you know what i mean to get there and taking off you like that yeah and i just i i just couldn't come to terms with it so um i mean again the word i use acceptance yeah you know i uh, struggled do you remember that night when you you used yeah that day you used yeah yeah remember it well where were you in Turkey, in Turkey, and I just, whatever, whatever, self-sabotage, that's it, whatever, fuck it. You know, my two favorite words, fuck it. Yeah. You know, them two words, just, pff, let me two foot the fuck it button. And that's what it was, you know, it wasn't a case of let me gamble to win, let me drink to enjoy, nah, destroy it, fuck it all, not been worth it, none of it's been worth it, it's all a lie, it's all bullshit, all recovery's a joke, bang. And, uh, and then the second I do it, then the regret, oh yeah. shit, it's too late. I've opened yeah. the can of worms, I'm off, I'm off. You know what I mean? I'm running. So when I went on loan, I was crap because obviously I'm carrying all the weight of yeah. all of this. And uh, and that's what that's what finished me up in Turkey. So yeah. that's what sort of happened. And I came back and I said, it's still getting offers because of what I'd done previously. I'm still getting chances and chances. And I was like, no, 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 no I don't want any of it. I want to come back. Came back, came to Wigan. Uh, and then didn't play for six months. So then it's like, now I'm thinking, should I go back to Turkey? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But I'm, I don't want to, because I feel like that's going back to- That's the chapter done, right? Exactly. So I feel it's got to be a new chapter. Uh, when well, you started using in Turkey that first day, yeah. th what the regret and the guilt you must've gone through waking up the next day, going, yeah. I've just broken a thousand days of being clean. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd actually posted on, on Instagram that was a thousand days. Oh, was it? Yeah, okay. Yeah, like, and it wasn't, it wasn't a thousand. I, I must've got or... to maybe, um, a thousand and one hundred, something like that. I must have got to around yeah. that figure, but but anyway, I, I remember actually posting that right, I got okay. to the thousand stage because it was obviously like, wow, like I'd, you know, I'd done it. Um, yeah, and that was Instagram down, everything, take everything off, you know, what I mean, back into hibernation, and then I've reappeared on LinkedIn. So yeah. I uh, about nine months ago yeah. started again on LinkedIn, uh, different audience, safer place, mate, safer place, safer place, yeah. safer. <laughs> uh, and I just share my experience. So built up quite a, quite a decent following yeah. just through doing that. Just share my experiences from the heart. This yeah. is my experience. Bang, 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 and uh, starting to pick up bits of work. So yeah. TV work, public speaking, radio. And I enjoy it. It's not the same as playing, but I enjoy it. It's an income. Mm. It's something to do. Um, and 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 what I want to do is be authentic in all that I do. Mm. So I, I forgive me for saying it, but those people who talk about, oh yeah, they make me sick. Yeah, you know I mean, it makes me sick. Give like, an example. Well, 
for <laughs> example, uh, there's plenty of them. When I do these speaking events, yeah. people will go before me or go after me, and I'm just thinking, what a load of shit. Yeah, like, I what think a, the same. Do you know what I mean? I'm just <laughs> You're regurgitating shit that someone's written. Exactly. Yeah, mate, yeah, I exactly. get it. Yeah, so like we spoke about before, yeah. don't come prepped. Yeah. I, don't, I just literally- Freestyle. Freestyle it. Yeah. This is what I've done. So every time you hear me speak, it'd be a different yeah. experience because- well, it's funny, when the start of here, you went, mate, where's your notes? What are you doing? I was like, freestyle it. Yeah, that's Let's it. Let's go, yeah. have a chat, see <laughs> yeah. where it takes us. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Mate, but I'm very used to like having that that when I when I go up into those industries yeah. people are sat there with a pen and paper I'm no. like nah just no. let me just it's win. easier you know? yeah. no one knows your story better than you to get up on stage and this is what I've gone through this is what I'm going through yeah. and I can help anyone out there yeah yeah exactly mm. and also I say this is what's helped me yeah I think it's really important the language you use yeah so so many people like to go this is what you need to do and I'm like everyone's well, different right everybody yeah. is different so this is what's helped me mm. you know take from it what you want yeah. you might take one out of the 10 things I list yeah. great use that one then listen to Dodge yeah. take his one and, and so yeah. on you know so I always feel like it's leading you back to you mm. it's not about me telling you what you need to do mm. it's just I, I just don't buy it mm. so Wigan mm -hmm. why did Wigan take you Colo Torre ex-team at mine at yeah. Liverpool um did you yeah. contact him? No, they contacted me. Contacted you? Yeah, okay. I had a few offers. So when I came back in January, because I'd had, you know, four years. January 22? You know, January, January 23. 23. Yeah, so this recent, year? Yeah, okay. Recent, yeah, I had four years playing in Turkey. Yeah. I'd, I'd done well. Yeah. So, yeah, I had a few offers. And, and uh, Colo managed to convince me to come to Wigan, which I was hesitant because I was looking at the club from the outside. Yeah. It's a bit of a mess. Mm. And uh, just an absolute disaster. Mm. Uh, great club inside. Yeah. Great people. Uh, the most patient fans, yeah. wow, super patient. Not what I remember. I mean, QPR fans, for example, they're down your front, they're they want you, results. They? Yeah. Wigan, super patient. Mm. Um, just the manager didn't fancy me as a player. Going on that there, QPR. That's when Harry went to QPR, right? Yeah. And they spent a fortune. Yeah. Do you know how much they spent? I and mean, do you know what players were around you at that time to build that squad? Yeah, so the, they actually spent it two years prior. Yeah. Then they got relegated and they kept them all, which was they had a bigger, I think they had a bigger wage bill than Bayern Munich. Yeah, that's right. The championship. And then I joined the following summer. So I joined with Rio Ferdinand, had a, was it Rio, which had done at the back. Um, you had Sean White Phillips on one wing, Charlie Austin, who, who wasn't a, a big name, but was our best player. Yeah, it was quality, sure, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you had Vargas and all these Chileans that had come over. So top, top, top team in terms of like individuals, mm. but collectively we, we we were crap yeah. like we just uh we were so below par um unacceptable and Adele Tarapat what a talent what a he talent was. he was yeah, unbelievable what happened the fool out there with, with him and Harry was oh, it because he was lazy yeah there was there was parts of that that it was this kind of thing yeah. he's lazy he's overweight and all of that he was in a, a cycle a bad cycle and um similar to mine which you know would be his story to tell not mine yeah. but um he eventually refound himself. Harry wasn't the guy to get it out of him, unfortunately. Mm. It was it was Warnock got it out of him yeah. and with Harry it just never never yeah. quite clicked. So uh, lots of talented individuals that just didn't work well together. The fans were angry. Just yeah, we, we all took a lot of abuse. Rightly so, yeah. to a certain degree. We didn't perform, I didn't perform to the level that uh, was required. Mm. And uh yeah, I'd say the QPR fans don't have a don't have a good memory of, no. of me or that period for sure. You looking in now and looking at what QPR did back then when they bought all these players on big money, are you thinking something ain't right here? All the players are coming here just for the pound note. Yeah, a lot a lot of players were definitely taking yeah. that move for it. I mean, the gravy train had actually stopped the year I came, yeah. so it wasn't the the okay. mega money that people had assumed it was. Yeah. Uh, still, really good money, obviously. Mm. Um, I just thought that it was West London. Uh, my choice between them, Palace and Southampton. Mm. Uh, I wanted to go to Palace and my agent was like, no, that's a nightmare. It was Tony Pierce who was the manager. Yeah. He's going to walk out. He's going to walk out. Don't go there. Quality manager. So, quality manager. Mm. And he did actually walk out a week mm. later. So my agent obviously had the inside yeah. info there. Uh, but Southampton at that time was really interesting to me. But that was 20 grand a week less. Yeah. And my agent's just like, are oh, you insane? He's yeah. like, I promise you, I'll get you to Southampton. Go to QPR, whatever Campbell happens, get I'll after. get you to Southampton. Yeah. And again, he did. Yeah. He got me to Southampton, which mm. is probably why Kuma never knew my name yeah. because of that whole, you know, that whole cycle. <laughs> but uh, the year that I would have joined would have been under Poch. So it would have been an incredible be experience. Quality, wasn't it? I was in my prime mm. at that time. I was playing well. I'd, I'd done a good year at Cardiff, mm. you know, so I was, um, maybe it would have been different, but I, 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 I was mm. I want to say chose, I was more pushed yeah. towards QPR. Mm. 
uh, and it just yeah, didn't work out. What was Rio Ferdinand like as a player and a fella? Yeah, top guy, top guy, really good. I'm still in contact today. Um, as a player, he was coming towards the end. He had a lot of personal issues, unfortunately, with his wife yeah. at the time. Um, but still great to learn from him, just like his habits, you know, like before training, he'd always be like the first one there, ready to go. He's always on the on the coaches, on the mm. fitness. It's time, it's time, let's go. Do you know what I mean? Obviously, he'd be at United yeah. in their routine Regimented, for so many years. Yeah. Like, you can't, you can't come late. Like, yeah. you need to be out there, set up, ready to go. Like, we're here, let's go. So, I learned a lot from him. Um, and obviously, just sort of, sort of off the pitch, you know, his business, he's very business minded. Yeah. And it was really interesting for me to learn from a young age, mm. like, oh, this, oh, like, learn that. Didn't take it all in, but I do today. Yeah. You know, I definitely like soak it all up today, and if yeah. I can. You got one England cap, scored on your England debut. Why did you not get any more England caps? Uh, performances dipped definitely. My performances dipped for Tottenham. I mean, Tottenham AVB took me outside, as I mentioned, as well. Yeah. Knock on his door yeah. and, and argue <laughs> with him. So when I took out a side, and then it's impossible to be picked for England mm. when you're not playing. I know you've got the argument about Maguire yeah. and Southgate, but he's a different manager, yeah. different beliefs. So uh, Hodgson left me out. Uh, that I then went to Cardiff, played every week, captain, playing well, got back in the England squad. Uh, just never put me on. I was in the England squad a couple more times and just never put me on, which I felt like, come on, like yeah. I had the one cap, one goal, like give me the chance, but he never did. And, um, and then I was sat waiting for the World Cup call because I'd been involved in the qualifiers, I felt, Maybe I'm going to get the, the, the call, at least for the preliminary squad. And um, we got a text saying that Hodgson would call everyone individually. He never called me. So I'd sat here all night, like, waiting oh, for the phone man. call. Never, is it as brutal came. as that, is it? Yes. Yeah, because normally brutal. players find out on Sky Sports News, don't they, sometimes before... Uh, that's, that's how it is, yeah. So for me, it was a case of that. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm there all night thinking, well, maybe he's going to call me in the morning. and you know. So at least an explanation would have been nice. But we've had our conversations since yeah. then, you know, and it's understood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but definitely at the time, again, it's like, bang, what do I do? I'll tell you what I did. I waited until the morning, still no phone call. I said, right, call two of my boys. Do you want to go to Mexico? Yeah, let's go, fuck it. Two words. Fuck it again. Fuck it. Bang, mm. straight on a plane to Mexico, steaming there for 10 days. Do you know what I mean? It's like, that was my uh, approach to everything. Yeah. All right, well, that's it. Fuck I'm it. I'm out of here. You know what I mean? I'm out. Mm. And uh, and that was what I'd do. Mm. And then I go black out for 10 days in Mexico, yeah. you know? So, uh, and then luxuries dry up. You know, that ability to just go to your boys, you'll jump on a plane, yeah. it's got a paper, it yeah. dries up. Yeah. Yeah. Because the pound note's not there anymore. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. So it's, it's those little things yeah. that obviously, all add up and by the end of it you're like wow the drinking and the gambling yeah. if you're just a drinker you can you can financially survive as a football player yeah. as a gambler it's it's tough mm. how many days clean are you today uh i don't want to answer it okay I don't answer it. the reason why for me is like every, every day is like a, a new day yeah, like take, I'm like, it, take every day yeah i've done it all before i said i'm a thousand days and i crashed and mm. I feel like, did you yeah. did you earlier on you said what what do you reckon triggers it for you you know, we're working out these yeah. triggers and we go to AA and you go to the meetings. Da, da, da. What triggers it actually personally for you? Yeah, for me, it's emotional triggers. So it could be around family. Yeah. So it could be a, often those closest to me. If you're not close to me, you're not going to emotionally trigger me. And then football. Football is just, yeah. when I go to a game and I see someone who I used to play with and they're there yeah. and I'm, I feel like I'm here. Um, yeah, it's, it's that battle where I still haven't quite accepted that yeah. the career is, is where it is. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, that's a big trigger for me. And in certain environments, I can often feel less than, uh, and it can it can lead me to, oh, I want it back, I want it back. Yeah. You know, what better way to feel better than getting my money back? Yeah. You know, what better way to feel, I mean, it's, it's, it's a myth, yeah. but it's it's there, it's a, it's a, it's a valid illusion, you mm. know? Give me the money and it will all be all right. Mm. Um, that's, what, that's what eats me up. But that's interesting, isn't it? You say, well, give me the money back. If someone dropped two mil in your bank, what would you use that two mil on today? Would you go back to going, you know, I've got two mil, I want to go and chase the five mil that I've lost? <laughs> probably, probably, <laughs> probably. If you dropped it into a bank where- You nobody, can't touch it. I can't touch it, or nobody knows I've got access yeah. to it, I'll probably be like that, yeah, we can't get arrested. But yeah, so it's like, uh, yeah, I, would, I wouldn't want it put in, put in my hands, put yeah. it that way, because it, it could easily lead to me going, well, that's, that's great, yeah. but I need that extra bit back, yeah. you know? So that's yeah. the thing, isn't it? It's always wanting more. Mm. So what work are you up to at the minute? So uh, part of my journey is, is is wanting to give back. You know, I've had enough experience myself of being on the outside of football. You know, one day I'm a Premier League footballer, the next day I'm out. So a big part of my focus today is helping young players as they transition. I mean, the stats are, are there for all to see. 99% of players in the academy system aren't going to make it, right? So 
what happens to the 99%. Unfortunately, players have come away, they're taking their lives, players have ended up in jail, ended up on the street selling drugs and so on, right? So my idea was how can I best support those 18 to 21 year olds as they transition, right? So firstly, offer them a new pathway back into football because Okay, there's 99% who aren't going to make it, but there's, there's there's options there, whether it be League Two, League One, whether it be non-league. You know, there's always an opportunity there to play football if that's what you love, that you enjoy. Secondly, into into new businesses. So we offer apprenticeships, whether it be to banking, to the car world, whatever your your hustle is, your side hustle, we offer those those mm-hmm. pathways. And lastly, but 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 you know, for me, probably the most important, we offer education. So whether it be University of Roehampton, free scholarships there, uh, we're currently discussing new partnerships for new universities for these boys and and women. You know, mm-hmm. our, our our aim at the moment is to to build out the the boys platform, and then in a year's time, we'll go right. There's your women. There's your women. There's your women's side now, where we can start to actually look into it and explore and help those. So there's so much going on behind the yeah, scenes. Right. It's an absolute beast. Mm-hmm. Um, but we just want to help support young men and women transition through football and out of football into new life because there's so much more yeah. than, than just football. That's fantastic. And what's the academy called? Behind the White Lines. Behind the White Lines. Yeah. Brilliant. Cool, because I've really enjoyed this episode. Yeah, likewise. Great chatting. Yeah, mate. Really, really nice chat. And thank you for your honesty. Yeah, thank you too. Like you've, I think you've gone through, you had some real deep, deep, dark moments, I'd imagine, with the ups and downs of what you're going through your career. But I don't think it's lost, mate. Yeah, I think someone out there come and take a come and take the opportunity to grab you on board. Yeah, how many years do you reckon you got left in you? Well, thirty one. I've still got four years. Yeah. I think I've still got four years. His average age is thirty five. Yeah, uh, because I had the break in football. I was out of football. Yeah. I, I, I physically, I feel great. Yeah, um, it's just getting that opportunity in the right place. Involved, I don't want an yeah. agent to force it. I, yeah. I want it to be someone. The manager wants, you. wants me. Yeah. The club want me. Yeah. I go in there. I've got an opportunity. Yeah. Um, so that's what kind of what I'm waiting for. Yeah. You know, I've had the odd bit of like, oh, I'll come in here, but it's through the back door. And, yeah, okay. Um, the right chance. Yeah. Mate, quality, mate. I've really enjoyed it. You're yeah, a proper gentleman, mate. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're a good it. man. Cheers, Corpse. Cheers. Good man. Yeah.